Hey, well, uh, this is another episode of To the Fullest anyways, guys. Uh, my guest today, Josh Conway. What's up? Legendary audio engineer. Man of <laughs> many legendary talents. For what? <laughs> I don't know. You're a fucking bad motherfucker, mm. you know? I've seen you do some pretty uh, impressive shit. Oh, thank you. On the audio frontier. So, but of course, not uh, not anymore. There are no audio shows to be done. No audio gigs to be had. No. Nope. Unfortunately for us. So, uh, we are uh, we were discussing that, looking into the future. I'm doing my podcast thing, right? And uh, trying to figure out what the fuck I'm going to do next with it. But I hope it works out. It's uh, it's a pretty sweet deal. If it does, it's it's very cool. I was very impressed. I, uh, I, I was telling you, I, was, I, I watched a few episodes. And I was, I was, I knowing you, I've worked with you. I know your work skill and all that sort of stuff, and I know you've got good work habits. But still, seeing it, you go, wow, it's professional. It's really good. It, it sounds good. It looks good. Um, I was like, okay, I'm gonna continue watching episodes and check it out. And that's, Thank you. I, we had talked a couple times about me being on and, and you know me being the lazy person I am. I just keep putting it off, and putting it <laughs> off. And, and I saw a couple of episodes. I was like, shit, I need to do this. Hell yeah, it's man! Fun. It's fun. It is it's fun. fun to just sit here and, and chat and have a good time, man. Like sure. it's, a, you know, um, I think there's a lot of anxiety getting into it um, for everybody that comes over first. There's like, I don't know what's gonna happen. And I'm just like, we're gonna sit on the couch. It's and like talk. a first date. Yeah, right. <laughs> And uh, and everybody walks out of here going, that was so much fun, and I would love to come back and do it again. It's like, hell yeah, we'll do it again, you know? I mean, fuck, I got to put out an episode every week. I'm, you know, it's like, I'm down to do whatever at this point. Like, let's yeah. keep on doing uh, interesting shows and having fun and, and talking to my friends. I feel like the conversations, we go about two hours, and then uh, we could just keep going at the point where we start cutting them off, you know? like. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, fuck, nobody's going to sit there and watch three hours of me talking to somebody it's, on my it's, couch it's kind of like uh you know you show up to a gig and you make sure you have more cables than you need because you yeah. never know which one's not going to work and so you, you film a longer episode and then you go uh oh, that was kind of crap right there and we cut that part out and i still got an hour and 15 or whatever and yeah you know so that's cool I man do you do a lot of editing on these or is it kind of like just straight through uh it depends on the episode yeah yeah sometimes there'll be something that'll happen where i need to go in and, and fix it um a lot of times though um it's just me doing all the live switching with the little controller that we were talking about. Yeah. And, uh, sorry about that. Yeah. And, uh, and I just, I run that and it, uh, I throw my fucking title sequence on the front, throw my end card on the back and I'm pretty much doing the entire editing process live. Uh, yeah. Like I probably won't even go cut that, cut that burp out. <laughs> I'll leave that burp in. So, uh, it was funny when you did that. I, I looked at you and I was reminded. Of my, I saw Metallica in concert back in like whatever 1988 or 89. Yeah. And this is when uh, Jason Newstead was playing bass and and he goes to sing a vocal part and he burps into the mic and then they stop the song and they do this whole thing about burping and farting in microphones. I'm like, of course I'm you know 15, <laughs> 14 whatever years old at the time. I thought it was funny and cool. <laughs> I yeah. guess it's still it's kind of funny and cool, but it's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. Good times. Yeah, I mean, what uh, what better to use of your time whenever you have uh, a gigantic fucking PA and like thirty thousand people in front of you than to just fucking burp as loud as you can? I've had some fun a few times. Yeah, there was a um, there was a gig I did with a uh, you know Larry Thomas, right? Yeah, a good friend of mine, and uh, we were doing the show. And this is like, you know, people will probably frown on this story and say, "Oh, you should have done that. It's not professional, whatever." But it was funny as shit. So. Um, we had this gig, and you know, we do all, all these corporate gigs where we've got live entertainment or whatever. And we had somebody playing. I think it was uh, Pat uh, Monahan from Train, his band. And afterwards, we had a DJ playing. Who this guy? I mean, he was a nice guy, but he, you know, he come out and he wanted to be like the host of the party and like really, he he thought he was an act. And uh, people were just kind of wandering off and not really paying too too much attention. He would get his microphone and he like he play on a long playlist and he'd stand down there and do stuff. So I grab my front of house mic. I'm sitting up there, and I just, as he's yelling, "Yo, yo, what's up?" I'm like, "Hey, hey, what's going on?" <laughs> and uh, and he, you just see the guy like look up in the air. He's like, "Whoa, what the hell was that?" He has no idea, <laughs> but he doesn't want to like throw him off, throw himself off, and and so he keeps playing along. And I just did that for like 20 minutes. Me and Larry just sat in front of house, <laughs> laughing our asses off the whole time. That's funny. Yeah, I mean, all kinds of weird shit happens whenever you're on the, uh, you know, out doing gigs and stuff like that. I remember uh, I was working with Purple Rain one time, and 
we had given the national act i can't even remember who it was uh but there's a national act downstairs at the house of blues i'm dealing with the uh, purple rain upstairs which is like a tribute to prince mm-hmm. uh and they're awesome and yeah, i've uh, worked them once on a corporate gig the, the guy lead singer jason is, yeah he's on fire he's amazing he works so fucking hard you know what i mean and he's like a really nice guy too like yeah definitely go check out purple rain whenever the quarantine's up like yeah, for sure that dude's been working really hard on that show give him your money but uh, anyway, so back to the story. So we're up there talking shit, having a good time, and uh, we had given the uh, National Act a list of frequencies not to use. These are the house frequencies. Please stay the fuck off our frequencies. This is how you do things. Uh, and I guess they had taken it as, here's a list of the frequencies that you're going to use because they lined all their frequencies up with our house exactly. frequencies, apparently. So now I have all these, like, uh, five, six um, you know, like RF microphones, like everybody had an RF microphone, so they can grab it off the fucking stand and like dance around and shit with it and move off their fucking spot to go like do their thing. But uh, yeah, uh, so we got all these RF microphones up. People are walking in. The front of house guy for the National Act had left all his channels open. Oh, God. And so now I turn on my microphones and we're setting up. And of course, we just start with horrible jokes and just talking <laughs> shit. And it's bad, you know, it's bad stuff. There's nobody in the room but us. And, you know, the mics are on. We're checking monitors. We're fucking talking shit. And it's coming through the PA downstairs as the whole crowd's walking into this yes. show. And I just, my homie, I fucking forget who it was. Uh, I want to say Schaefer or something like that. But uh, one of my friends fucking comes storming up the, the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> just going stop stop you know like trying to turn those microphones off man and <laughs> uh, just good times man like yeah talking shit never know what's going to happen that's the things those are the things i miss from doing gigs you know it's like yeah i miss seeing friends i miss uh the accomplishment of doing the job and all that and, and i think for a lot of us who do what we do i mean i'm always amazed when we encounter people that aren't like this is their passion that they they love doing shows and entertainment and and you know you, corporate events maybe there's not like such so much show and entertainment involvement but a lot of people have come from that background and still do a lot of that work and uh, like for me i <clears throat> i do mostly corporate work these days because well it's it, here in vegas i mean that's a big part of our marketplace and and i can do i can work for myself i can be self-employed and and uh pick and choose who i'm working for a little bit better manage my schedule a little bit better and i can be home most of the time i don't have to travel if i work I mean, i've worked for national artists and stuff like that before and it, i've done the residencies in town that's been great i had a lot of fun working at the coliseum doing a bunch of stuff but those don't come across always like very often and the money in the corporate industry like to do a to go out and mix one microphone at a time sometimes for ten thousand people in an arena yeah gives me as much money as mixing that same arena with 20,000 screaming fans and I had to sleep on a bus at 80 miles an hour oh. and then load all that crap in in the morning and load it out at night and, and I do this corporate gig I load it in on Sunday and I load it out on Friday and it's the same gig and I'm sitting in a cushy chair one microphone at a time hitting a cue it's like yeah it's not as creative and it's not as fun uh, as maybe it's doing the big shows but it's, it's still got its rewards and it allows me to yeah. be home and be involved in my kids life and you know that's a big deal. I remember uh, early in my career uh, doing some shows. I grew up in Maryland, D.C. area, and I was doing some sound with a company called Mar- MSI, Maryland Sound. And uh, there was a guy who toured with all these big acts, and we're talking, and, and he tells me a story about how his wife had passed away from cancer like a couple of years prior. And during her treatments, he wasn't able to like really be there, and his daughters got her to treatments. And as she got sicker and sicker, he finally was able to get some time, but it was like basically just before she went into hospice, and then she dies, and then he's got to go back on the road. And he doesn't have this relationship with his daughters, and, and he's like, they resent him for not, you know, all this other stuff. And I started thinking about it. I was like, man, that sucks. I mean, here you are, because a lot of what we do is very selfish in, at times because we're thinking only about our, ourselves and our personal growth, and, and it's fun and exciting, especially when you get involved with shows and big concerts or whatever. It's it's a blast. You're you are the party every night. You're the thing that somebody's been thinking about for months. You're involved in that, and you get to do it every night. And it's a cool gig. Oh yeah. And if you let your if you start thinking about it too much, and you start thinking about yourself and where your career can go, if you just keep pursuing this path path of self selfishness. Sorry, I can't speak. Uh, <laughs> you know, you miss out on so much more personally. Yeah. And and, that, and then so I I started looking at okay. I toured with some bands before coming to Vegas, and I, I did some Broadway-type shows touring. I did cruise ships, and I did a few other things, but I always found, like, where's my home? 
where do I, like how do I go home and relate to my friends? How do I maintain those friendships if I'm never there? If I'm traveling all over, girlfriends, forget it. It's like you know, I would meet a girl at, at a gig and and we would get involved and. I would tell her, hey, by the way, I'm the guy who does the gig, so the gig's not here tonight, tomorrow night. It's it's in another city, and that's kind of how this relationship will go. And I get phone calls, you're an asshole, you're never home. I'm like, I told you from the beginning. So I was like, <laughs> you know, it's like trying to make sure all of that stuff uh, worked out, and I was finding I needed to have, um, I, I needed more personal out of my life. And so that's yeah. why I moved to Vegas and eventually got into the corporate industry where, you know, we, we do as well as we would do if we were touring with those bands and doing those shows but I, we get to have a home life I get to have friendships I get to have relationships I get to have a son and raise him and uh, but back to my original point it's like I meet a lot of people on the gig who who are doing sound and doing or whatever lighting whatever it is that are next to us and they, they just kind of stumbled into it and they do well with it and you know they make a career or whatever but they're always like yeah, it's not really my thing, but you know I'm doing it. I'm like, how could how could this be not be your thing? This is such a cool thing. How could it not be the thing that you thought about doing and you would do for free? Yeah, you know, and I mean, teach their own. Everybody's different, but that's the kind of most of the people I know, like yourself. It's like you have a passion for it, and it's like oh, absolutely. And you and when you get on the gig, you think about it that way. You don't just uh, you don't just be like, oh, I got to do, I have to do this so I can get the check. And then no. go home to do the things that I really want to be doing. It's like no, when I'm <laughs> this is what I want to do. <laughs> I had to. So uh, Chris Brown, the guy I'm living with right now, uh, a, you know, he's a good, great sound engineer. He's got a long history, and we've been talking about this stuff. We're sitting in the backyard, and uh, we're talking about. It's like, man, let's just set up a PA somewhere, right? Well, we, like, and I saw this video on Facebook, and I actually posted it on my Facebook page um, of a guy who did that. He he's some local sound guy somewhere in some city. And he goes and takes his, you know, uh, you know, truck, backs it up to a venue that's like an outside pavilion kind of thing, has a crank mount, raises up some speakers, sets up a whole line of subs, goes through the thing. All right, kick, kick. All right, good. And he's got like a little soundtrack that he's playing. And then he mixes the show. And there's no, and he has a mannequin for an audience. And I was like, that's exactly what I want to do. I, I, I love doing what we do so much. I want to just do it for free and to yeah. go set up a PM. Like, that's what I want to go do as my hobby. It's like, yeah. So... Anyhow, that's what I, I, I mean, I was just talking, uh, I was just talking to AG the other day and he was just like, man, I can't wait to get back out there and do that. I was like, fucking get me back out there and do Dude. that. You know? Cause I was like, uh, I was like, I miss it so much. You know, like that's, you give me the coolest toys on the planet. Literally. It's like the, here's the best consoles and here's some of the best speakers you're ever going to fucking get. And guess what, Jason, you get to fly them. You get to you get to fucking tune the whole system. You get to do all this cool shit to it, and then you get to operate it and run a show. And it's like, uh, really, fucking sweet, yeah. right? Like, I mean, I'm so stoked. I'm so stoked. Like, yes, let me play with your toys, please, because I'm just so fucking into flying speakers. I'll go out to a show, and there'll be a big old line array speakers. And it's like I fly bigger line arrays than that, right? But I don't give a shit. It's a big old fucking thing of speakers, and I'm just like, look at all those speakers, man. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> let's go check that shit out. Yeah. And uh, and I just I, there's something about it that I fucking love, man. And getting to do it for a living, right? And getting to go out and, and like travel and like. Not that we get to really see the world, right? We're, like, we're working the gig most of the time. But, I mean, you know, you get to go, like, on little adventures and fly PAs and come back. And it's, it's fucking great. I love it. I can, and, and, and it's a lot of fun, man. That, that, that is the bummer about, like, when you're traveling for work and you go to these cool cities sometimes. Is Like, there, I have some uh, – some of my favorite cities I think to visit for gigs are, like, New Orleans and New York. Um, I mean, there's a list of others, too. But uh, those two cities really work out because – as long as I'm staying and working in the city area, there's always something to do. It's really easy to pop out of your hotel and go find something that's always going on. Um, but if it's one of those cities where you got to jump in a cab, do Ubers or whatever it is, and go find things, and it's uh, after you've been working a 10- to 16-hour day, it's like the last thing I want to do is go find something. Yeah. Um, but the, the one consistency for me is like if I can find a good hockey game or a baseball game, uh, on the pro level, uh, 
uh, minor league too. You know, it's like I'll, I, if I, as I travel and I can find it, it works in my schedule. Yeah, I'll always go do that. I love I love seeing. Uh, oh, live right while you're oh, in yeah. the city. I mean, in the stadium. Yeah, yeah. of course. And you, you know, uh, did you try that last year? I was in San Francisco, and I and I uh, I've always wanted to see a game in that stadium, and, and I'd be out there doing uh, Dreamforce, which is a big you know thing in San Francisco every fall, and and I'd always have like this one day. I was like, okay, cool, I'm gonna go this one day, and then. We're scheduled to be done at six o'clock. Game starts at seven. Perfect, you know. I'll make it out there, and of course, you know, it gets to be like five thirty, and they're like, "Hey, so we're gonna go a little late tonight." And you're like, "Fuck, man, I was gonna go to that game," and uh, so this happens year and year after. And finally, this last year, I was out there doing a gig, and I was expected to work once again. I haven't to have time to get off to go to the game, and so I uh, we're hanging out, and finally, the client walks by, and I told him, I said, "Man, I really would love to go see this game. So if you don't need me to hang out for this last rehearsal thing, yeah." Let me know. And then half hour goes by. He walks by. He goes, go ahead and go. I'm like, I ran outside, hooked up with the Uber driver or whatever. And he dropped me off in front, walked up, bought a ticket for like 11 bucks because it was the end of the season. They weren't going to make the playoffs. And uh, watched the game, walked around the whole stadium, sat there in right field as somebody hit a home run and the little air jet thing goes off. Somebody in the water catches it. It was like all the classic shit you want to see from that stadium. It cost me eleven bucks to get in, but it cost me twenty bucks a beer, and I drank a few. So yeah, they get you on them fucking (laughs) beers, man. Dude, no doubt. But yeah, they got to make their money. Yeah, yeah. I I I I do miss uh, working, but I have I have also really enjoyed the time off and and uh, being able to just decompress a little bit, going through uh, personal stuff these days over the last several years and. It's been nice to just uh, be able to just relax and uh, hang out with my son, work with him on schoolwork. Um, that's been challenging at times, but, uh, you know, he's a lot like me, you know, stubborn as hell and, and kind of has his brain working a thousand directions, not sometimes always right here. Yeah. And, uh, but it's been cool. You know, it's, it's but, uh, we're, so we we're talking about um, what's next, and that's been a big thing for me. It's like, uh, you know, we were talking earlier. At first thought, you know, do I need to go out and get a job? And I even thought, like, Home Depot and all these other things. And I started thinking about it. I was like, man. It's like, well, you know, I, I looked at my money. I figured out how to do stuff based on mortgage, car payments, and whatever. And uh, I was like, okay, well, I've got enough money to last me this much time. With that. I like, I'm not going to even worry about it until I get close to the end of that time. And I'm just going to relax. I'm going to just think about things. And I talked to a few friends. I got a... a good buddy of mine Elvis who I mixed Blue Man when I first came to Vegas and uh, this guy is a guitar player with Blue Man I think you may know Elvis uh, oh yeah I know Elvis yeah, yeah, yeah. he's awesome yeah and um, so Elvis has this band called Ubershaw and they they play at the Double Down usually at the last Sunday of every month for the last freaking 20 years or whatever and uh, and he's got a few other bands uh, Unique Massive and he does a bunch of other work which you know plays but he, we over the years we've kind of developed some, we've done some shows together where we took Ubershaw and we had Terry Bozio sit in and we did a thing at the Smith Center and uh, did some, a couple of shows at Studio 54 based around the Ubershaw vibe and we did, we used to do these really cool ones uh, at Studio 54 sorry I mentioned it was at Brooklyn Bowl not you know Studio 54 we used to do these shows called Open Forum and uh, it was based around Ubershaw would play couple sets like they normally would and if you don't know Ubershaw they're they're a jam band but they're not like your normal jam band and they have usually in drums so yeah so it's bloom it, it came from Bloomin. I think I think the Elvis one time told me a story that uh Ubershaw came about because he went into a, a venue that was a small place called um uh shit I don't know it's, it's like a little coffee shop whatever it's across the street from UNLV in that building that had like a sunken first floor and then you went up and it always flooded and all that stuff and um it was a, it was a, it was a cool uh spot and and so they would go in there and he, he talked to somebody he said yeah do you have a band and he didn't have a band and he went and went back to the blue man dressing room and goes hey anybody want to jam and do this thing I got a, I got a gig and they were like oh yeah sure whatever and so that's kind of how the band formed and it was they don't have songs they just sit up there and they jam usually like a 45 minute set and they'll do like two maybe three sets a night but uh you know it starts three three or four drummers across the front all playing different kinds of kits and two guitar players and a bass player with massive effects pedals and um so we they, they took that format and then we brought it to studio 54 where we added in 
this was more Elvis's brainchild. I was just kind of helping with the production, technical, sound side of things. But um, you know, we brought in uh, some performers from Cirque shows, dancers from Celine Dion's first show, A New Day, and uh, musicians also from other Cirque shows, and we created a variety kind of thing where uh, you know they. Ubershaw would play. They have a DJ who opens the place up, Studio 54. It's a nightclub. It was more of an industry night thing. and um, But it was it grew in popularity quickly and became like a big deal. And so you had uh, DJ opens, Ubershaw plays a set, then DJ comes back, and then they do. And there's always transitions between. There was never a, a, a law in the, in the event. And then the, they would do this dance routine that Ubershaw has now got to do their jam thing, but it's kind of a song that they've made out. So anyhow, we would we had a lot of fun doing that, and um, I would work from I would get there at like eight o'clock in the morning, show up with my truck just weighed down with microphones and speakers and all sorts of gear, and load it in. Maybe I had a friend to come help me, and work until like three four o'clock the next morning. Load it all back up in my truck, and then drop it back off to the sound company that loaned it to me for dirt cheap, and um, I got one hundred and fifty bucks. I was like. And I, and I would have done it for free, and 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 a lot, and, and I continue to do these gigs with these guys where it's like I'll make almost nothing. Yeah. And like the the Bozio gig, did two shows at the Smith Center, and I don't know, I made like one hundred and fifty bucks, and I brought out like thirty, forty thousand dollars worth of my own microphones. Jeez. And it, and it, but it's it's a, it's a labor of love, and it's yeah. things that I love doing, and I, I would have done it for free. And Elvis is my brother, you know. It's like, but so, what's next? It's like okay, well, I want to continue on that process of you know developing and creating my own thing and uh so kind of loosely around the idea of what we did at open forum uh but hope is to be able to create a company where we we offer entertainment for a lot of corporate events we can also create our own like you know where we'll come in four wall something and, and create our own event uh it's like a smith center kind of vibe but do more of that and have actually it grow to where it makes us a lot of money and we have a lot of fun doing it not going after the idea of a, a, a show that sits in a place, but have it be like for hire for special events and um, traveling around. And, and it's, it's, it's a lot of people would be involved also have something else going on. So uh, El, you know, Elvis and I would kind of spearhead things and we would bring in creative partners depending on the client. And um, so that's one of the big things that I'm hoping that he and I can sit down and work out and, uh, and we've we've had many talks over the years, but it's now now it seems like a good time to start something new again. Oh yeah. And uh, so with that, like the other side of it is, a few years ago I had some talks with a, a company about uh, getting sound production out here on the corporate level from a touring company. And uh, due to like my own personal my, my my marriage was not going well, and it kind of didn't help make this new business venture work out. But now that things are, I'm moved on, I'm getting divorced, and everything's working out better. Uh, I've thought, you know, I should get back into that, and so that's the second part of what I'm looking forward to next is going back to creating my own business. Um, it's two part: the creative side and then the production technical side, and taking those risks that I've always, I've always wanted to take. I mean, I take, I'm a big risk taker. Moving to Vegas was, I had a phone call with a guy. I was on a tour. I, I meet a guy in a bar who's a friend of a friend who knows a friend in Vegas who does sound for Blue Man. And, uh, you know, I, I said, I want to go out there and do sound for Blue Man. He was, and we hung out for the week. He came out and saw me mix the show I was doing, checked off, make sure I was good enough. And then uh, I, I get the guy's phone number. I'm like, hey, if I fly to Vegas, will you meet me? He's like, yeah, sure. And that was about it. And so I told my parents I had a job because I didn't want my parents wearing. I was 27 years old, and I, I'm kind of a – risk taker and I always just thought the less they know is the better you know, I'll tell them the details later and so we're uh, I get a I I'm, go to the tour manager I said I'm leaving the tour I need you to buy me a one-way ticket from Washington DC to Las Vegas and I finished the tour you know, they had a few more weeks to finish out the tour and they had a replacement for me and I uh, literally took the duffel bag and suitcase in my little electronic worker box uh, went home to my parents house washed my laundry and then jumped on a plane the next day and flew out here. And when I was in Chicago, I, I realized I didn't have a place to stay. So I called the guy who I'm going to meet and said, hey, man, do you know where I could stay? He's like, dude, you're on your way out here and you don't even have a place to stay? I'm like, 
no, <laughs> I didn't really think this through. And uh, he goes, shit, well, I, I don't even know you, so you can't stay with me and my girlfriend. So <laughs> he goes, there's a place called Budget Suites. They do nightly, weekly, whatever. Oh, no. It's not far from the Luxor, so you can walk. And I'm like, all right, cool. So I, I literally get in the cab. I'm like, take me to Budget Suites, go over there. And I stayed there for a week, and then I got uh, another short-term rental kind of thing, and then I bought a house, and I was like, I'm here. But, um, you know, I like taking risks, and I'm not afraid of it, but they're calculated risks, and I think about it, and I, I go, well, what's the worst could happen? And so, I go, so as my career is built, I, I've been able to remember the risks that I took before and how I was able to overcome whatever the obstacles were then. Well, shit, I'm already at that point moving forward. I don't go backwards. Yeah. I don't need to relearn those lessons. Nope. So all those all these difficulties that happen in life well shit i've had difficulties and i had we were talking about this before so i mixed blue man for four and a half years loved the gig it was like i put my heart and soul into it moved to vegas for it but then they moved to venetian they didn't take me and it was a, a whatever a personal political whatever you would call it but it didn't happen and um i was heartbroken but then i found another job and i got into the corporate industry working for a company uh doing co- av convention side of things i never would have thought of i hated the job when i first started it i remember calling my dad and he goes uh i was like dad man, this is not me man i'm a rock and roll touring sound engineer i do I, shows I, man I, I hang out at bars afterwards uh, i mean i don't go to a shirt with go to uh, work with a pair of khakis and a shirt tucked in and uh my dad just kind of laughs at me he tells me this whole story i won't bore you with the whole thing but it's like basically it was like a story about his dad telling him a lesson of like look you do the job. You have the job. You already have it. So your reputation is based on who you are while you're at the job. Now, you can go and like half-ass it because you got a bad attitude about it, or you can bust your ass, learn everything you can about it, become really good at that, get the respect of the people who you, who you work with, and you'll have respect for yourself because you know you gave your all. It's like, uh, and, and, then, and so I changed my attitude. I was like, oh, well, shit, maybe there's something I can do here in this corporate industry that I never would have thought of. I start seeing all these guys who were like me. They toured, they've done shows, but they're doing this. And I start, why? Oh, because the money they make is really good, and it's stress is pretty chill. Yeah. And you get to work with good clients and good friends and gear, and it's like, shit, this ain't bad. You know? It's really not. It's for for going out and 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 getting paid to do something you love, man. You know, it's 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 a sweet deal. And uh, it's definitely not mixing bands live, right? And you're in the in you're in this fucking huge fucking uh, mass of energy of all these people that are just fucking jubilant at the fucking night, man. You know, just like the fucking love what's going on. They've been looking forward to it, like you said. And energy is just at a fucking eleven. And um, there's this uh. There's a satisfaction of when you leave that uh, party at the end of the night that you, you got done throwing for everybody. Uh, I don't know. There's just there's creative satisfaction and there's this fucking this energy that is really like fulfilling or something. I, 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 I don't know the right word to say for it, but. Uh, being around all those people in that party environment, even though I'd like I wouldn't be drinking or anything. Uh, I just, you know, be mixing bands, smoking a little weed and fucking having a good time, you know, that way. But the difference between doing that and then going and mixing a fucking room full of people lecturing each other on business <laughs> statistics, you know, and, um, and these people don't even know each other. Right? like most of the people in the room are like from everybody's from a different place because they're all just there. There have to be there because of work requirements. Yeah. Right. Um, and so they're fucking, uh, yeah, it's, it's just, it's totally different energy, uh, absorption that you get from the gig. And there's not that when you leave the corporate world, there's not that creative, um, satisfaction of you just got done painting this beautiful mix all night and everybody loved your mix, you know, or, you know, that one guy hated it, but fuck him. <laughs> uh, he doesn't, you know, he was standing, uh, he was probably know, a sound guy in himself. a bad spot in the room. Yeah. And that's my favorite thing is, uh, whenever you're mixing a band and a guy comes up and goes, you know, I'm a sound guy too. And I think, and I just cut him off right there. Cause I go, first of all, if you were, f- if, <laughs> if you really did this for a living, you would never fucking come up to me and tell me shit exactly. because you know how obnoxious that is. Yeah. You just shut the fuck up. You'd bring earplugs and protect your ears. 
right? And you wouldn't even care about the mix like the rest of us because I don't fucking go to a... I mean, I don't go to a concert to analyze the mix and then go tell that guy how to do his fucking job, you know? I'm there to see the goddamn band. Yeah. I'm going to put earplugs in. I'm not going to get hit in the ears with some loud frequencies. And I'm going to, like, pay attention to the guitar player, right? Or pay attention to the drummer. Drummer, my favorite. I love... Pay- that's that's usually who I groove on is the drummer lately. Yeah. But... But yeah, fucking assholes like that, they, they, they crack just, me up. It usually comes with, uh, so I do sound at my church, and, yeah. and, and you're like, okay, what, all right. But, um, but I'll, I'll say this, church industry is uh, hardcore into production these days. I mean, there's certain, not every denomination, church, whatever, but I, I've had a saying for many years, no one has more gear than God. Oh, yeah, and well, he's and got all the money. I have another saying, so it's about the sound engineer comment, and I think this one's kind of funny. The only thing that two sound engineers can ever agree upon, the third guy sucks. Yeah, that's so true. That guy so, does suck. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I, I was, so there's some fucking uh, argument of uh, three audio engineers on, it was a meme, where they uh, one fucking audio engineer is going, your fucking attack and release settings on your compressors are horrible. I can't believe you'd fucking do that. And the guy goes, you're fucking, you can't hear shit. It sounds perfect. My attack and release settings and my ratio are exactly where they need to be to make it sound good. And then the third guy comes up and goes, hang on a second, guys. It's bypassed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. That's, that's, a, that's see... No that's one's a, gonna laugh at that joke, but us. I was gonna say that's something you could throw in your your, your routine. <laughs> like, so Jason, I don't know if you guys know this, but Jason wants to be a stand-up comic or is aspiring to be a stand-up comic. And uh, he was telling me some jokes earlier, and I laughed my ass off. But that's one of those ones that's good. Yes, it's an inside joke, but I think it's still. I don't know. It still might be worth slipping in there just for the sound guy in the back to have a one. Just for the sound. You're going to hear the... That's one of those ones where you're literally... You're only going to hear the audio engineer in the back of the room crack the fuck up, and the whole room's going to be crickets. They're like... What's he talking? That's sometimes because you don't even mention in the compressors, room, right? You that don't even the, mention. I that is. I like that's the best person to be in the room. The guy who sits there and like, you know, gets it or whatever, and laughs, and then the the guy on stage goes, "Thank you," you know, right. or whatever. It's like, I don't know. I, I I find some things funny that not always everybody else did or something. Yeah. You know? Well, having a unique sense of humor is uh, part of the spice of life. It's like certain people don't find. You know, comedians that like uh, Dane Cook, right? Dane Cook, he's interesting. Dane Cook's a great example of that. That motherfucker sells out stadiums. People wow. love that dude. But then other people fucking hate Dane Cook. So I, like, I, I, that is not funny. He's never been funny. You know what I mean? Like, And I'm not saying either of these are my opinion. I'm saying that he's he's a great example of a huge divide where he's, he's fucking selling out some big places. Yeah. Like People think he's hilarious. And then other people are just like, that's not funny at all. I don't understand it. Well... Controversy sells, right? Yeah. I mean, you can't you can't just be go up there and tell nice jokes. So, um, but I, I, so on Dane Cook, I worked with him, and I and I, I worked in the Coliseum. He did I don't know half a dozen shows there, and and you know one of the cool things about that gig is you know you, you get to be right on stage and you're part of the you are the crew. I mean, it's especially for a comedian or whatever. It's just me and the one other guy, and um, so you so you get a little in, in, uh, time, and. Uh, he he started telling some jokes that crossed the line for me, and uh, it had to do with like rape and abortion and yeah. a few of those other topics. That I was like, "Hey man, that shit ain't funny. I don't care how you tell the joke, that shit ain't funny." That's why he's doing it, though. And, you know? But I know that's why he's doing it. Gets but a reaction. I, I after that, I was turned off. I was like, "I ain't gonna bother." I I'd watched a lot of his episodes or whatever and things, and thought, "Okay, that was funny because it was TV friendly or or you know HBO friendly or whatever." Um, but then when I saw that, I was like, I mean, yeah, he's apparently got this reputation of being going on stage and for 20 hours straight and just not repeating a joke. Um, he's got this, you know, he's one of those guys that like is hardcore about his practice, and I, I respect that. But th- those sort of things, I'm like, yeah, man, that crosses the line. Well, those are notorious things, right? Like, um, that's a conversation that comes up a lot uh, in the like, in like I was saying, I was researching the stand-up comedy field and like. Uh, a lot of people will take a hard stance on that where they just go, there is no such thing as a funny rape joke, right? Like, don't fucking try to make a funny rape joke. You're never going to make a funny rape joke. And then so now basically what they're saying to the other comedians in the room is like, oh, did someone just throw a fucking gauntlet down? Well, now I'm going to just write rape jokes. And it's just like, well, because you said it's off limits, right? Now uh, I can't help myself. And so, and same with the, you know, the abortion thing and all that shit. So I, I fucking, um, and it's, it's hard, 
those are the hard ones. Like if you, uh, they're mostly not very funny, you know, when people try really hard to come up with a rape joke. And, uh, I only remember laughing really good at, at hard at one good one. And it wasn't really a rape joke, yeah. you know, it was like pretending to be one, but it just kind of threw a punchline out, but it's like, the, yeah, but they, they draw that line in the sand yeah. and then people are just like, Oh, that's what I got to go do. You know, like if you put that line there where it's like, this will never be funny. That's all. They, they, people are going to obsess about it, and they're going to be like, I'll figure that fucker out. I'll find out how to make it funny. Comedians and performers in general, I think people that used to be in that front person on stage with themselves, uh, they kind of, I think a, a good good majority of them have that personality where they want to one-up each other a little bit. And um, Absolutely. And, it's, and, and of course, you know, I mean, you got to stay current. You gotta, people got to talk about you for something, right? And, and um, so... I, I was comedian. I think is one of the hardest performing jobs out there because, you know, jokes are funny the first time you hear them. Maybe the second time, if it was a really good joke, you'll laugh again. But that's it. So you got to keep writing new material, and you got to tour around. And you, like you can't get like repeat. Like a concert, somebody like, like Grateful Dead's a great example. People go and see Grateful Dead like every show they ever did. Yeah. Or whatever, and they're all, and they're like recorded them all, and they're all unique and different. But they played a lot of the same songs over and over again throughout those many shows they went and saw. They didn't care because they were you know songs you can sing along to, and it's like it's great. Jokes you can't tell the jokes along to it and still find it funny because I mean, no. at the end of it you're just like yeah I heard this one. So. That's a hard gig, and when you get people on stage who are are not getting it, I so uh, years and years ago I worked on cruise ships, kind of in between some things, and and uh, we had this com- <laughs> comedian juggler whatever dude on stage, and he was bombing, and uh, <laughs> I liked the guy. He'd had some good shows. I'd worked with him before, and he'd done well. But this one, he was just not getting them, and his timing was off, and, it, it, and he let it affect him. Yep. And, and they got in under it. his skin. And then all of a sudden, you just see his personality turn. He starts getting like angry and spiteful towards him. And at the end of the show, he goes, You know, there's a saying in show business that you're only as good as your audience. And I want to tell you tonight, I really sucked. Ah. And he was, so he was telling the audience that they sucked. And, and yeah. then, so then all of a sudden, these people were all calling the captain of the ship, This guy's horrible. Da, 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 da. They had to yeah. get him off the ship in the next port because people were going to like hang him or something. Oh my God. But I've seen other comedians, like uh, I worked with Carrot Top for a little while, and he. he was able to, like, he had a, you know, he was always funny, and his shows were yeah. always good, and he was always, he's. I, I have a lot of respect for that dude. He's a real creative him. dude. I love Carrie He's Tom. constantly writing new jokes, and he's very current. and um, Super nice dude. But he'd have a show or two where people were just not getting his jokes, and he would just plow through it, and he'd be like, I'm going to get you anyhow. And, then, yeah. and he would. And he might be pissed off at the end of the gig because he had to work so hard, but he was like, oh, fuck you. You're going to laugh, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you got to do, too, man. Like, uh, I was watching... Um, Dave Chappelle skits, right? Like yeah. just just recordings of him live on YouTube, and it's him telling the same fucking jokes over and over again, kind of, you know. And and one time he'll nail the timing of it, or it'll be placed right in the set, and it fucking kills. And then the, you'll watch him do the same joke again, but his timing's a little different, or he adds an extra sentence to it, so now the punchline's a little longer out, and it, it puts this. It's just that slight variation that's been added to it. Maybe that you know, it doesn't fucking hit at all. And he just has to keep trucking along, right? You know, you do, obviously you don't turn and start spitting on the fucking crowd, <laughs> saying it's your fault exactly. that the timing of the joke fuck got fucked. You just move forward, right? And like he just goes, ah, ah you know, and and continues as if he hasn't even told the punchline yet. So Chappelle's great about that, by the yeah. way. He'll drop the punchline if they don't start laughing. He ain't dropped the punchline. That wasn't the punchline. I still got more joke. <laughs> and it, I, he's real good about that. Like it's fucking, it's genius. That guy's a fucking genius. And and I think honestly, he just comes up with it on the spot too. Like when that. happens happens he just whatever he's thinking and well apparently did you see um uh his uh what was it uh tom sawyer award winning thing that he got yeah so and and that you know there's a lot of interviews of people and the guy who helped him write the Chappelle show was talking about how a lot of that shit on the show that's famous lines of his now was all ad lib and um you know, Robin Williams is the same way. Like they would give him a script, and he would be like, "All right, I, I get the general idea." Mm-hmm. And Mork and Mindy was like a lot of, and so people, it's it's brilliant the people who can do that. I think that's freaking awesome. You know, I mean, to take off, I have a hard enough time spitting out words just having a conversation sometimes. You know, and to be put under pressure of like all eyes are on you and you got to be on it. You know, and to you just spin the shit off. Improv is blows my mind. 
But the harder part, I think, sometimes is being the person that's acting with them that has to respond to that, knowing that that shit, I wasn't expecting that line. I have to now react to that. And, and I got to be, and it's got to work, you know, because I'm going to be the one who ruins the scene because he just did something fucking brilliant. Yeah. And I just ruined it by being a dipshit over here. So that's <laughs> no the harder, shit, right? that's the harder time is like going, oh shit, I got to be next to this, Rob Williams. Oh, f- I better step up, you know? And yeah. So, I, but that's, I think that's the best thing to do in life. As I, when I was playing in bands when I was younger in high school and stuff like that, uh, I was remember talking to my dad one time and I was like, yeah, my band's good. I'm okay. But you know, it's, whatever. I was moaning and groaning about shit. He goes, you know what? You should start playing with musicians that are better than you. Yep. Like, and, and the ones that you're afraid of playing with, start playing in those bands because you're going to get better because you're going to have to catch up to them and they're going to teach you some stuff and they, they, you know, just tough it out. And, and so I've kind of carried that philosophy throughout my career. It's like, I've jumped in both feet many times when I wasn't ready for something. And, uh, you definitely all, you should always do that. You know, the first time I ever did a big RF gig, it was in Vegas and Vegas is a pretty dense RF scene. And, um, it was, it was at the Coliseum. It was gonna be the head audio for Shania Twain. And, and it started out as gonna be smaller RF system and, and it was more manageable. But then as the show grew, they were like, Oh, we need to add this. And then people were wearing multiple packs and, and it grew a lot. And, and so, I I had done some RF. I had done. I knew how to work some. You know, I, I was pretty good with up to like 45, 50 frequencies. But now I was approaching close to like 80 or you know 90 frequencies, and uh, I'd never done that before. But I'm learning it while we're doing the show and loading in the show. And I can't fail or else I'm gonna get fired. Yeah. So every day I'm like going home. And I'm sitting there. I mean, like while I'm on the gig, I mean, I'm like hustling. I'm not just. I'm working. I'm not freaking out. You know, that's the big thing. Don't ever let clients see you like get it in your head. Just yeah. stay, staying cool. I think that's the thing that's gotten me more gigs than anything in my entire life is my ability to just be chill. And uh, actually, Dave Torty, who hired me at the Coliseum, said one of the reasons why he hired me over there was because a gun could go off behind me, and I'd be like, "Oh, what was that?" You know, yeah. I wouldn't freak out, and I would stay calm, and I'd be able to do the gig. And, um, but yeah, it, I completely forgot what I was saying, <laughs> Okay, but, um, yeah, anyhow, moving on, go on, Jason, you can edit this section out, right? No, I ain't in uh, shit. You're fucking, you're fucking up. I'm going to make you look bad on t- on, uh, thanks. online. No, it's a real conversation. That's how it happens in a real conversation. I, uh, yeah, I, uh, I don't give a shit. It's fucking great. Like that's how. That's how people talk sometimes, you know. There's little. I remember what and, it was, and right? I like having things be natural. Yeah. Uh, what was it? See, you got All it right. back. See, bam. All right. So it was talking about jumping in two feet and not always being prepared and like working yourself into gigs that are better than what you're qualified for. Sometimes, you know, you, you it's important to know what you're doing. And I, I, I'm big on education. Every year, I always want to go and get trained on the newest things that I can do, and I try to push myself with what I what I'm doing with it too. But um, sometimes, like opportunity comes around and you're not 100 percent ready for it but it's it's around right now and when's this how long have you wanted for this gig how many how many times have you dreamed if only this gig would come along you know so that was kind of the way it was with the shania gig is i was just starting out in the freelance working on my own and i get this call hey are you interested in taking this and i was like yeah sure and he told me it was small and we worked out numbers and it was cool but then it grew and grew and grew and i was like shit i don't I, i'm not I'm not qualified now for this position. I think I can do it though. And so I hit up all my friends who are smarter than me and ask them questions and I get software that works, you know, better and it helps me out. And, and I sit at home every night with my laptop and, and, and next to my wife and just sit there and go, how do I do this shit? And then after she goes to bed, I go downstairs. How do I do this shit? And I'll get three, four hours of sleep and I'll come in the next day and I'll show up earlier than anyone else and, and implement the things I learned the night before. And then I'll try and throughout that next day, okay, I need to make it better. And then next night, same process. And I continue to do that and I, and, and until I get good at that thing. And, and I love that butt pucker factor where you're sitting there going, I might get fired if I don't get this right. I better get this right. Oh, they'll fucking fire you. Oh, fuck yeah. Dude, shows that are happening now, especially live events. <laughs> you're fucking fired so fast. I've been the guy, unfortunately, a couple times who's been called in, hey, this guy's not working out. Can you cover? Yep. And like, uh, and I, and the worst is when you walk in and you know the guy and they haven't told him yet. And you're like, you're like, Hey, what are you doing here? Oh, fuck. (laughs) Um, well, I make them fire the guy though. 
I, I, I yeah. I, I, uh, I go, I go, uh, I'm an audio engineer. You're the boss. Yeah. So you go tell him the bad news because that's not my fucking responsibility. And as you're taking him away, I'll sit in his seat and start fixing all his fucking mistakes. But like, I don't, I ain't going to walk in the room and go, oh, you're fucking fired, bro. That's fucked up. And it's not my job, right? Like, uh, you're the supervisor. <laughs> I, it's you know they don't want to fire the guy either. It sucks firing people. I've I've had to fire plenty of people. I've had to fire people, and I've been. I have only, let me see. I've technically been fired twice in my life, uh, uh, but both of them weren't really firing. So yeah. But um, anyhow, uh, yeah, man, it's it, it. I like I said, man, the the first when people come into the industry or, or they're coming up and they're like, oh, I want to do what you do, and they're like, okay, I'm going to teach you all sorts of stuff, but the first thing I can't teach you is how to be cool yeah and that is the most important thing you got to be cool because you're going to be working in some stressful situations sometimes and you know the saying is cool heads prevail it's true here man Big and time. if you if you're freaking out and you can't communicate you're you're not going to be hired back i don't care how smart you are i don't care whatever you did but you just showed your true colors right there you're you're going to freak out when the show's hitting shit's in the fan yeah because it's going to hit the fan i've had so many shows not well not a shit time but i've had a lot of shows that are big level high stress shows where i just kept working and was able to fix an issue i mean i'm not some superman here i mean i know a lot of people who have similar stories but mm-hmm. uh you know it's like I, at the coliseum we had uh, this old ssl console that was left over from when celine dion was doing her original show there and it's an awesome console. It's amazing. It's uh, designed for mixing broadcast shows, but and uh, it's an SSL. I mean, you can't go wrong. No. But um, but it's older and it had old processing and all that sort of stuff. And so one day we had done sound check and uh, I get a call. Hey, the PA went quiet. Uh, so I run in, find out the console has done a freak out. Got to do a reboot. Well, the reboot doesn't work the first time. And we got an audience already in the house. Nice. So, oh, shit. All right. So that doesn't work. But I'm the only person who, because the guy who, my boss, Dave Torty, is on vacation. And so I'm calling him. Hey, man. Talk through some shit. And I keep running. I have to go downstairs, upstairs, downstairs, upstairs. And I'm the one running, hustling. And they keep. And so the guy who uh, manages a facility for AEG is sitting there with a tour manager of, it was Bette Midler's gig. And so they're all sitting there, like all the top brass is sitting there, like watching me, and and knowing, and I'm the only person who's got the ability to fix this issue. Yeah. And I'm sitting there going, I better fix this issue, and I, or just keep trying until I do. So I'm going through the process, and I finally get the console up and running. We get it, it's, it's working, and it's like it was literally that last effort that they were willing to give me. They were yeah. re- they were willing to send home, you know. 4,000 people and pay back the money and whatever if I didn't get this fixed after this moment and it worked and I was like <sighs> and I was like oh god thank god it worked you know and, and I felt good about that moment but it's like had I freaked out had I you know not been able to keep a, a cool you know logical mind of the process that I had to do of like the shutdown process the startup process I mean like there's multiple sh- machines there's multiple computers and there's a you know you, uh, the console itself had to be turned on it's like it had to be a sequence of things and and I was the only one who I, I didn't want to c- trust another person in that moment. I had to trust just myself and hustle. And it worked. So it was fun. It le- I learned a lot of shit in that moment, you know. And the, I think the biggest thing I learned was stay calm. Yeah. I, uh, you remind me of this fucking gig uh, I did at the club where some, something was wrong with the fucking dimmer rack. But I was like, for sure, I could fix this problem, right? Like for the lighting system. And uh, it's old school park and a dimmer rack. And so the parts, I, like, I was able to get the parts. I was able to fucking, like, crack the thing open. And, uh, and I start getting it fucking going. And we're starting to put it back together. And it's just, like, not going back together properly, right? Like, and, like, uh, I needed, like, some specialty tools. Some long extended, like, magnetic screwdrivers and shit. And, like, to really get things into place. And I just didn't have them. And we were doing our best to make it fucking work. And it was like fucking showtime was getting closer and closer and closer and closer and closer. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, my God. You know, like this shit is just fucking uh, it's like it's like a fucking inch away from being put back together for like hours. But it just can't seem to like fudge into place. And I just was I'm like starting to lose my fucking shit hard. And, uh, you know, thankfully, like. Like you said, it's like, uh, 
I got the fucking whole dimmer rack upside down because this fucking one piece is like rattling around inside of it. It's like a screw. Some bullshit like that. I'm like, we can't just like have that fucking hanging out inside of there. I was like, but everything else is fastened down. I was like, fuck this. Smack it together. And I'm like, it all just slides into place real quick. And I was like, fuck that screw. Shut the door. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't need it anyway. Start plugging in some fucking stage pin, baby. We're getting this going. Get, get ready to pull the curtain, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like oh man like the show like barely barely went off on time it was great and like those moments are just uh <laughs> you'll never forget those oh, fucking moments fuck. my buddies from fucking uh yeah damage inc i think uh-huh. we're doing we're there helping me out every time i saw them after that too they're like how's the dimmer rack <laughs> i i think Dimmerack's great I think one of the big reasons why I laugh so hard at that is I can relate to it so much with so many different stories. It's like there's, there's been this conversation many times with, amongst friends. Uh, we should create our own, like, Spinal Tap kind of stagehand. You know, oh, yeah. Behind the scenes, whatever. This is what our life is really like. And, um, I mean, it, it, it is cool, like we said before. I mean, the stuff we do, even the, even the boring corporate gigs is cool. I mean, a lot of times it's the 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 chatter on, on ClearCom, you know, our intercom systems and stuff like that. and that that's sometimes the things that i enjoy the most or look forward to and but um and then you know there's there is an element of production that we have to do it's like every time i i still enjoy the fact that when i start a show whether it's mixing a band or mixing um a corporate gig that first time i push up that fader for that first microphone and what level it's going to have and what's tonal quality because this is my first time now with an audience in there the room changed oh yeah and uh you know Am I going to be happy with it? Am I going to work on it? And, uh, you know, and, and the satisfying thing is that most of the time you feel pretty good about it. You're like, oh, it's better than I thought. I got more gain than I thought I was going to have. I have better bottom end than I thought I was going to have, or whatever. And um, so, yeah, that's one of the things I, I, I guess I enjoy. But I, I, had just, I, 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 I have these moments <laughs> where my brain starts going in different directions and I have the ability to not remember the thing I'm currently talking about. So yeah, apologize no. for that. That's the, you know, that's how it goes. Uh, well, fucking, uh, uh, I was just doing a gig recently where, uh, if I didn't smoke weed, yeah, I wouldn't have that problem. I wasn't going to say that you smoke <laughs> weed. If we weren't smoking weed every time the camera flips back and forth on us, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> fucking, uh, no, uh, my mom's not living anymore, so she won't be ashamed of this. Oh yeah. My mom doesn't give a fuck. <laughs> Uh, what was it? No, uh, I was doing a corporate event recently, and I had a fuckload of speakers, right? Like, I had uh, 72, 12, 64s, like the big monsters on, yeah, it was on sticks, yeah. just fucking lying in a room straight across it. And they, those things get loud. Yeah. And uh, and so I, like, I test my shit, and I ring it. You know, I ring it proper and everything like that, and it's like, fuck, I'm not going to need any of this PA, and, like, I'm going to turn this up halfway, and they're going to tell me to turn it down, right? But then the crowd gets in there, and uh, uh, they are the rowdiest bunch of a corporate crowd I've ever had to fucking deal with. It's so great, man. Like, like I was saying earlier about people's energy, right? So this wasn't, like, a lesson thing, right? Like, I don't want to give away who fucking, I don't know, you know. But uh, it wasn't like they were doing lessons with each other. They were like, we fucking rock, right? Like, at those kind of parties. We're going to give away awards. We're going to yeah. celebrate this region. And we're going to celebrate this region. It was one of those fucking things. And I couldn't fucking get the microphone. Every time they'd say anything and the crowd would start clapping. I think Lowe's and Home Depot, those kind of guys, that is those who it, cheers. That's who it was. Yeah. Yeah, it was Lowe's. Lowe's is the loudest. They're the yeah. f- they fucking get down, <laughs> dude. Like, yeah, it, it was so much fun. I was so stoked to like see that kind of energy in those corporate environments where, like, a lot of times it's not really encouraged or whatever. It, it, but it, they, is, it is fun seeing that. I mean, yeah. it's like it, it's it, corporate world is. I mean, there's a reason why you and I don't necessarily fit into that. It's like I have a hard time doing the raw raw speeches. Uh, my ex wife asked me one time. She went and had a job interview at some property in town for some banquet gig and, and and they gave her the you know after they go through a preliminary questions and such they go tell us a, an example of when you uh sorry this is my corporate white guy voice uh when you when you get, gave 110 percent or went above and beyond i'm like so, so she she comes back to me after the interview and she asked me what's that what's that whole thing what would how would i answer that question and i was like well i said this is part of the reason why i don't work well and like having that normal job i i i, I think it's 
everybody follows their own path and I'm not poo-pooing anybody else's path by means. But being true to myself, the reason why I don't fit into that is I don't buy into that. And I don't, and I, and I, and I, and I the saying of like drinking the Kool Aid, you know, and, yeah. and, and it's like I, I have a hard time with that. And then usually, I'm the person who gets irritated by it and goes, "Oh yeah, I'm gonna fuck with the system a little bit here or something." You know, it's like, <laughs> no, uh, see you what don't I do see that. what see what I can get away with here, you know. And yeah. and um, so I, I told her, I said, "Well, in my opinion, it's a bunch of bullshit because there's no such thing as 110. percent yeah. You have 100 percent of anything." Yeah. Okay. So the most you can ever give is 100. percent And this idea of giving a, over 100, percent I that, whatever, call it my little pet peeve or whatever. But I think it's bullshit because we, as most people in society, like I, I say, a, a good majority is probably give like 85 percent of our efforts that we could possibly give and yeah. call, it, call it giving 100. percent Yeah. And so then when we dig in a little more and give a little more, we call it above and beyond or giving 110 percent or whatever. It's like. No, it's like you really were capable of doing that much all the time. Yeah. And I was kind of coming back to the conversation I had earlier about my dad, like, giving me this pep talk when I had the new corporate gig that I wasn't digging because I was wearing khaki pants and whatever. It, it's like, could you have done more? And the, the, the example he gave was, like, about sweeping a floor and how his dad had a job and he worked somewhere and he was, like, a maintenance guy. And his, he kept getting these raises and he, or he, got, he got this raise or whatever, got a promotion, and he questioned why. And his boss had told him, he says, well, you know, anybody can go down and sweep the floor and sweep around things and get and call it clean. But that's not doing all the job. If you pull the chairs out and you move the furniture around and you get in and out and you cover every inch of that floor, then you've done 100 percent of the job. And so I took that to be literal. Like, so now, I mean, like. Unfortunately, it's wrecked my brain. Every time I go to sweep or fucking run a vacuum, and I start, I sit there and go, "Well, that's good." No, it's not. Shit, I gotta pull that out. All right, hold uh, on. Dad's talking to me right now, you know. And uh, uh, but I take I take my gig the same way, and it's like a lot of people, even ones that I work with and respect, every now and again, this sometimes may come up. But you know that never give up kind of attitude is like when shit hits fan, you can't figure it out. Well, get the great thing about our current time is we got Google and YouTube. Yeah. So if you don't know how to do shit, look it up. It's right there network of friends. There's a bit, big list of people that yeah. are happy to take that phone call. I answer those phone calls all the time yeah. where people say, I don't know what the fuck to do with this. Can you talk me through it? And of course, of course I will talk you through it. I'm yeah. happy to talk you through it, you know, because uh, before I had been doing this for 20 fucking years, I had people I could call and say, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Can you help me out? And they would fucking help me out, man. Like, you know, and I love that about the... The, the network of people that we have, right? Everyone's there for each other. That started for me back in when I started. And that that personality type and the attitude of of um, uh, giving back and, and helping people and stuff like that. Um, I, when I was early in my career, I, I, you know, I had the opportunity to do some cool shit. Where I was, I went to a college, uh, Middle Tennessee State University. It's a uh, state university, but it's got a four year bachelor of science in audio and recording and. Uh, it's a really well-respected school, and I like it. And while we're there, they also have a program where you can help out with the concerts that played at the local arena and so on, or do the live events. And so I got into that, and that's kind of where I got more live audio experience. I, mean, I dabbled in it when I was a teenager with my own bands, and that's when I really started getting it. And so tours would come through, and uh, guys would be sitting there. I remember like one time uh, it was Rod Stewart was playing through, and I got done doing my work, and I went over, and I wanted to see what the front of house guy was doing. And so I went over and I stood kind of like over in an area where I could look and see, okay, what is he touching? Why would I think he's touching that? Da, da, da. And I wait for my moment and I go, hey, man, can I ask you a quick question? And the guy would turn to me and be like, hey, fuck off, you know, man, you know, I, I'm working or whatever. Just, just blow me off. Yeah. And, and I remember a couple other times, like different situations where I go and ask somebody who knew something that I wanted to learn. I'm like, hey, man, would you mind teach me? And I'm like, man, nobody taught me shit. Go get a book. Yep. And I was like, fuck, these guys are assholes. No wonder why like grumpy old sound guy exists, you know, like I that know. whole term. It's like so. I was like, when I get to the chance where I know some stuff, um, I'm gonna anybody who wants it can have it. And, yeah. You know, it's like people don't hire me necessarily because of what I can do. They hire me because of me. Yeah. And um, and I'm not worried about losing gigs. And I hope that I do sometimes. You know, it's like I I, I have a ton of network of friends who I'll I'll be like, hey man, I got this client. You should work for him. Here it is. You know, and uh, and they end up working for him sometimes more than me. It depends on what's going on. You know, and, and and I'm I'm happy. I think it's cool. My calendar is still doing well, and I'm still making the numbers I need to make, and and I'm having the growth of my career that I want to have. Yeah. But my friends are too. 
Well, and uh, ultimately, man, like uh, in my personal experience, it's gotten me more work because uh, instead of being greedy and trying to hide everything and not allowing my helping my friends to grow, um, the, uh, it, it's it's put a bunch of opportunity in front of me, right? Great opportunity. So I help. I help some of my friends grow, learn new skills, and they go off and they're getting these jobs and they're moving up the ladder and three years down the road, they give me a call and they're fucking offering me my full day rate because they're working for this other company doing the same fucking thing I'm doing and it's and you know it's not because of me. I'm just saying along the way when they were having trouble, I helped them out and I helped them fucking uh, learn a new skill and they remember me for that. I didn't tell them to go fuck themselves. I was like, fuck yeah, and call me back if you need anything else, man. You know, like... I'm here to help you, and I hope you have great success in the, in the industry because it's a good industry. And, um, yeah, and so not only does do they end up throwing me work later down the line, it also allows me to throw work I can't take someone else's way where I know I've taught this guy how to do this. I've seen him do it. He's fucking great at it. So when someone calls me and says, hey, Jason, can you take this gig? I can't, but... This motherfucker sure as hell can. Yeah. You don't got to call anybody else. Call me first next time, too. Remember that. I took care of the gig in one way or another. Oh, uh, that's a risky run. I mean, yeah. I, I, it, has, it has gone that way. Like I said, I have had clients, and, and um, I, I have a day rate that's uh, on the higher side. It's not the highest of people I know who do what we do. but uh, And I know that because of that, you know, I'm at risk of always – you know, losing a gig or something like that if if, if it's bu- budget driven, and I'm, I'm I'm grateful. I mean, I've got a lot of repeat clients who understand that like there's a reason why you pay for certain things, and it's not to say that I'm better or whatever, but it's just um, it's just kind of like whatever. Anyhow, whatever. But I've 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 had friends of mine who I have referred to other clients who do a lot of like they'll they'll do a few big gigs a year and they'll hire me for all those big gigs that like you know like there's some band involved or whatever, or big PA, and they want somebody who can handle that size of things. But the majority of what they're doing is smaller stuff. And so they don't need me for that smaller stuff because they can get guys who are cheaper who are qualified to do the breakout rooms only and all that sort of stuff. And um, So they don't hire me for those. And that, So I'll get a gig where I recommend a friend of mine who charges $150 less a day or whatever, and then they call him for 12, 15 gigs a year, and they call me for three. Yeah, and I go well. You know what? I'm. I mean, yeah. I, I wish they would call me more because obviously they have a lot more work than they're throwing my direction. But I get what what they're doing and why they're doing it. It's just business. You can't like it. W- so I, I I have real estate. Uh, like I'm a landlord or whatever, and and I also do other business. Things. I'm self employed. I have a business and all that. And one of the things I've learned is you, you can't mix personal with business. No. Business is business, and it, and it's got to be all about black and white when it comes to business. There is no gray, and you and you just work out terms and you and work under me. Like I get to gigs, and if the if the gig's not what I uh, agreed to, then I don't have to do the next gig. But I'm going to still do this gig with all my best, and I'm going to give them everything, and um, or you know whatever. But it's like business is business, and m- my only terms are I'm going to come I'm going to come you know, you're going to uh, communicate with me what is expected up front. I'm going to do the gig. I'm going to do it well, and at the end of it, you're going to pay me. And you're going to pay me within reasonable terms that we're going to both agree to. When you don't pay me <laughs> yeah. within those reasonable terms, that's when you'll see a different person. It's like, I'm like, hey, man, the only reason why I did that gig is because I need to pay my bills. Yeah. And so, but that's where it's business is business. It's nothing personal. I don't hate that person because they didn't pay me. I don't, whatever. I don't get angry about it. I just go, just give me my money. Yeah. And um, I, I mean, I've thankfully not had to deal with much of that. Uh, I've not had, in the corporate industry. Well, in no, the music industry more than no, the corporate industry. For I mean, me there, there's there's been I, there was a production company unnamed that I worked with uh, who they were notorious for net whatever, and um, you know I never I, I, they would book me on a lot of shows and and I got to the point where I was like okay, okay I raise my rate raise my rate raise my rate and then I got to the point where I was like well shit I got like six shows in the books with these guys next year and. They knew, like at the end of the year would be I be I would be waiting on like three or four shows that are back to back that are all like four or five thousand dollar invoices and it's coming into the holidays and I did I didn't work tons November through December so I could spend time with the family and I got just spent money on Christmas and blah 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 and man I'm broke and I'm waiting on these checks that are like some of them like a hundred days out and you're like dude That's ridiculous you know the time of year it is right could you give me one of those checks 
And then I and then so I I just I hit them up and uh, I had shows that were booked in late January with them in February and March and April and whatever. I hit them up. I said, you know what? I'm done. All those shows for next year are canceled. And they're like, oh shit, you know, because I was one of their main A ones that they worked with, and they had these shows booked, and they didn't, they they wanted a guaranteed guy instead of trying to find a new guy for these clients. And so I, I, they, I said, they said, uh, what's it going to take to keep you around? I said, all right. I, I threw out a number that was just way higher than what I was charging anybody else for a day rate. I said, you can either pay this, and it's just maintain the same process of net whenever, but it's got to be within net 90, and or I'll keep my same day rate, and you just guarantee, pay me, guarantee me net 45. I wasn't even asking for net 30. And they were like, we'll agree to the more money. I was like, shit, I didn't ask for enough money. That was the first thing I realized. I was like, I should have asked for more because they would have paid it. Always ask for more. And then I do a couple of these gigs, and then they screw me over on one with a big money issue, and that was it. So I did three of the six gigs that I was supposed to do. So yeah, so I, what the I, point is, like, sometimes you have to dump clients. Um, and thankfully, like, that's my one and only really having that kind of story in my entire career of where you're – like, look, it's about getting paid, and you ain't paying your bills, and you guys are kind of screwy with things, and I'm going to move in a different direction. And and when you consider it, you're like, this is a client that in my year pays me, like, say, 40 grand or whatever, and, uh, well, you're going to replace 40 grand. You know, it's like, yeah. you got to go Easily. out and hustle. Well, I mean, you can do it. Easily. The bi- the, you know, you're the big- an audio engineer in Las Vegas. That's how you... <laughs> well, the big issue is here. Like, Just let until, people know that you have those dates available. Up until recently... That was an easy thing to do because you just, well, yeah. people who you've been saying no to, you just call them up and say, hey, one of my clients has moved on or whatever. Or you just say, hey, my calendar's open up. And you start saying yes to them more, and then all of a sudden it transitions. I've never, yeah. year after year, never had any, like, slumps where, like, uh, like the Shania gig was only two and a half years. So, I mean, when that ended, that was a big lump sum of money that I made over on only, like, 14, 16 weeks out of the year. I made over half my income and covered my insurance. So I was like, well, shit. There you go. And now that's gone, and i got to replace it with something else. And the good thing about this town is there's you just always start saying else. there's always something going on. Well, there, there has been always something It'll going It'll come on. back. Oh, totally. I mean, It'll come back. They were making way too much fucking money. This, this city funds the state. Yeah. They're not going to let Las Vegas collapse. You know, like, that's just not going to fucking happen, man. The whole state would go broke. Yeah. It, I mean, not over this fucking weak-ass virus, bro. They're just not going to do it. They're going to they're going to take it as far as they can. And for whatever reasons, I don't know. I I can't know. You know, like I'm just I'm just nobody. But they're not going to fucking let the strip collapse. That's an insane thing to do. Uh, it, you know, uh there's just too much it the entire economy relies on it, man. So it it'll come back. And all these corporate fat cats need to do these shows, right? Like everyone's like, "Why the fuck uh, is Amazon not paying any money in taxes? Well, it's because they're putting a show on like literally every week somewhere in the country. They're blasting their money, and they, that's tax write-off, and they're going to fucking keep doing business that way because it's that's that's how these companies do business. We're we're gonna our jobs are going to come back, like oh uh, yeah, and, and probably fucking in a nasty way to where they're just like fucking fire selling convention space, you know, and there's just going to be so much goddamn work, or we won't have a day off for six months. But who yeah. knows? But I'm definitely, I'm definitely not worried about it at all. Like, like I was telling you, I was like, I'm trying to do this podcast thing, and I'm like, I'm hoping, like, oh man, like, uh, as long as I can stay on unemployment and do this podcast thing, and like try to get it the fuck off the ground, you know, before they start taking my schedule over again. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm like, hey, every day is a blessing for me, man, that I'm still doing, and I'm still able to collect unemployment work on this thing, and fucking. And just like focus on being creative and artistic and, and trying to get a different flow of income coming from more creative directions as opposed to just selling my technical stills, skills to the highest bidder. This is really cool, though, what you got going on, because I mean, I've, I've always thought, you know, I'm a I'm a planner type of person with my life and my career and whatever. And I, I, I do usually like a three year, five year, 10 year kind of scenario. And I. And I the three year consists of like a couple of breakdowns within that to like see if you're on the right path, and then three years you should achieve some goal that makes you worth going for the five year because they should be connected to each other. And I think the exact same way. Yeah, and so, um, you know, uh, damn it, stoner moment. <laughs> stoner moment. So I have my like my, my one year plan, like my one to three year plan. Right, is like 
hopefully get this motherfucker monetized within a year, right? Like you you get the thousand subscribers, four thousand watch hours. By the way, please subscribe. Please watch a lot. Uh, but thumbs up, like thumbs it. up, like it. Do all the things, right? Like you know, just go watch my meditation videos and just let them play. They're ten fucking hours long. Do me a solid. Uh, but no, seriously. Um, you know, like I'm just like, hopefully I can get this monetized within the year, right? Like you consistently get subscribers every week and move forward and then we're like from that point like we're making money so if we can make enough money to like pay for we already looked into a lease on a on a like a little business place right we're just like fuck like uh you know like keeping the money we're like we'll take the money we'll invest that into getting this whole studio out of my house so i can have my house back (laughs) and then uh that's all tax deductible bullshit whatever you know like i'm paying money for a fucking business that i'm making money on uh and and hopefully by three years it's like I'm making enough doing this to where I don't have to do anything else. You good. know, and then well, you know, we'll see what happens. The good thing about uh, stoner moments is that sometimes this, the thought comes back, and and that did again. Uh, you know, you're what you're doing here is like I was getting as like the whole three five year plan, whatever thing. My my big one over the last several uh, years has been trying to find that thing that I can do. Where like all right, I got I've got this gig down. I'm, I can go out and I can do a show. And I can set up sound systems. I can work with people. I can manage crews. Whatever it is, that I've got, and and I can and I can only I'm limited to the amount of money I can make on that gig because unless I get into owning the gear and running the gear and managing all that or a, f- a few other things, how do I make more money off this show? I mean, yeah, I mean you I, have to get into the rental of it. I mean that's what I started doing. Well, I bought myself a PA. I'm going to start renting and and having you know other people run it for me like intentionally yeah. like so where I'm not physically there making the money, my gears there making the money. Exactly. And I'm making money somewhere else. Well, that that's one avenue is like you can you can like own equipment that's running and I and I kind of I've dabbled into the idea of playback systems and and things like that wave servers or um uh but a big part of, I think, the idea for me that works out is the design side, getting on the front side of the design of the show and involving vector works or whatever, and also getting just more involved in that front-end technical drive of how the show is going to be created. Yeah. Because if I can be the guy who is helping doing that, I'm one, I'm out now able to, like, on those traveling gigs, my nights can be spent on a laptop making money doing drawings for the show that's coming down the road. Plus, I was more involved with the show from the front end, so I'm more likely to be the guy there no matter what, and I get my bookings further. So it's like multiple levels are better for me because I'm getting uh, more access, I'm mean, more exposure, just because I'm now involved with the front end of the the actual design and production. Yeah. And also, I've, I, you know, it's like what drives that a lot is audio is, yeah, it's cool, it's fun, and, and, and it's very important to every show that's involved because if you can't hear what they want you to hear – it's a waste of time. There's no show. I mean, every every element is important, but the focus has shifted. I mean, you can have so let's you have an audio issue. Say you have a, a feedback, or you have a speaker that's making some weird noises. Almost everybody in the room is going to notice it the second it happens. Oh yeah. And they're all going to turn to the sound guy and go, "What did you do wrong?" And it could be just an anomaly that just happened or whatever, or you could have done something wrong. But you have a light that's spinning around in circles randomly over here in like some part of the set maybe 15 percent of the people will notice that random light doing that thing unless it shines them in the eyes yeah and then the operator can go in and cancel that light or do whatever and fix it but no one will really notice it video same thing it's like you could have had a glitch going on 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 this one outboard screen and most of the room wouldn't even notice and so it's like the it's the kind of like the pressure is a little bit higher there but the the shows they've become all about the visual, yeah. And you know, uh, video in and all the massive video walls. I mean, it used to be projection screens, but video walls have become so inexpensive and so like adaptable that everybody wants them. Um, the only big issue with video walls is the mooring because of the you know IMAG of you know. But that's the only issue. It's like they're they're a dime a dozen, and you can build these huge video walls. So now the budget is all gone into video, which take taken done two things to audio one it came, took up our real estate where we used to hang our lo- line arrays it's yeah a fucking video wall behind it now so now we got to put these smaller speakers that are tucked way up and then if you're working in ballrooms you got limited you know space i mean if you're working in an arena no big deal you just put a massive line array above the video wall but uh so you know yeah so and then we got that plus our budget's now gone 
they're asking us to be a cheaper package. That's why a lot of companies like a VER or whatever, they would do these massive tours and they would get their money off of lighting and video and give away audio. Yeah, literally give it to them. Literally give it away. One of the reasons why I lost a lot of money too, that they really messed up the industry. They did the whole Walmart thing, you know? It's like yeah. we're going to come in and underbid everybody and just take away everybody's business, but you, you can't sustain it. Then you just fucked up the industry. Yeah. <laughs> so then everyone's just like, oh, well, can we get that Assholes. price? It's like, no, you can't get that price. Yeah. That price is not reasonable. There's a lot of companies I respect out there that uh, have done a really good job. They're not the cheapest, and but they are they offer just really good packaging, and they do a really good job of what they do, and they're professional, and you get what you pay. It's like I was saying before about like having a higher rate. It's like, look, you just get what you pay for, You man. do? Getting somebody who walks in the door who's got their shit going on, they, they're not hungover, you know, they're pres- you know, it's like that's worth something. Yeah. You know? Like- so. That was a big part of my thing whenever I first started. You know, I came out of the music industry, and I was just fucking Grizzly Adams, right? I had I the big talking beard. talking about that earlier today. The long hair. I didn't give a fuck. <laughs> this is, a, you know, and I was just like, and I had a shitty attitude, too, in the beginning, you know? And, like, I uh, I mean, I was happy to be there, but it was just like, you know, I was kind of like, what you the fuck You were just rock doing? and roll, that's yeah, all. Yeah, it takes a second to adjust your mindset to that corporate world. You're just like, what the fuck happened, you know? Like... Um, not that it wasn't a great decision financially to go do right, but uh, and I just spent the last the last year, last almost two years now, more focused on my presentation, uh, how I talk to people. Yeah, right? look at you, man, the clean like, shaven, cleaning my hair all hair up. up. Good, I got Lord. the nice haircut. So pretty, you know. I let the ladies pick out the hair. I was just like, it's not about what I want, right? I was like, I, you know, you, you go to the stylist and you go, make me fucking look good for these corporate people you know like i I just don't give a fuck what mm-hmm. i look like i want to look good for my you know to get the jobs and i got the suit and the tie and the jacket and everything i can show it has nothing to do with being an audio engineer no nope. has nothing to do with audio and uh but the difference and the respect you get and like the the attitude that you get from the client is different and um yeah and just like consistent work you know like people go oh fucking a you know like i've, I've i don't even give a shit i'm com- i'll completely conform to whatever fucking asinine things you want me to conform to i have no i have no personal stake in this right you're paying me the money we talked about right i'll wear whatever the fuck you want do you mean here in a fucking pink jumpsuit and some fucking slitted glasses with fucking feathers all over me bro you're paying me that rate it's on you know like i don't care you know let's do this like it's just like fuck my ego and uh yeah. And uh, and that's made life so much easier for me, man. You know, like uh, focusing on the personal touch and uh, the the what I'm presenting to these clients. You know, whenever they they hire me, I show up looking slick for them. You know, yeah. like I ain't fucking yeah. It, that that I just I think it's funny that that's so important. And it took me a while to understand how important it was. And once I once I did it, it was like a fucking hammer to the head of like duh dude like it obviously makes a huge difference i uh i i'm not as good at uh looking the part i guess in the corporate world when i do gigs um i'll wear a jacket when when requested yeah i have one available it's it's the jacket i wear probably every once a year at best and that includes weddings um <clears throat> ah. but um yeah, man. I, I mean, I got I've got a full sleeve of tattoos. I got a tattoo on my hand. I got, I got a half sleeve in this arm, uh, chest panel, all that sort of stuff. I mean, I and I, and I come from a background of doing shows in rock and roll, and um, and one of the things that I've 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 learned over the years is like, if you represent yourself as yourself, and don't come with false pretenses, um, people will accept you. Yeah. And I've traveled all over the world and I've learned the same thing. I've made a lot of friends in different places with totally different cultures. But if you come just true for who you are and 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 be cool and be open to that letting them be who they are, then they're going to be like, "Hey man, you're cool." And so in the corporate industry, it's kind of the same way. There's a few things like surgeons are weird, you know, they're kind of funny. They want you yeah. to call them doctor. Yeah. I'm like, "Dude, you're not my doctor and I don't work for you." <laughs> so, "Sir or Mr., does that work for you?" <laughs> but oh. um but yeah, so I mean, I, I you know, I, 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 uh, um, I, I dress well. I, I show up on the first day, load in, you know, I mean, clean. But I've, I might have a T-shirt that already has holes in it because I'm going to get holes in it today, and 
and uh, maybe blue jeans, you know. But unless the client says, no, no, we can't do that. I said, oh, okay, fine, I'll do it. And then show days, I'm wearing a nice pair of black jeans usually, not slacks, and a nice button-up shirt with a collar, and it's most likely short-sleeved. And um, I have not once had a client, other than that one who I actually ended up telling you about I had money issues with, they asked me because I was doing some things for some big medical thing, and they had all the senior doctors who owned the company or whatever. They wanted me to wear long sleeves that day. I was like, whatever. Yeah. But I've never had any issues, and people actually enjoy the stories behind them, uh, and they sometimes enjoy hearing the stories about working with bands and stuff like that. And so it's the whole package of like just be you and bring you, but be presentable. Yeah. Be be polite. Be kind. Well spoken. Don't drop f bombs every fucking yeah. turn. Besides, <laughs> I just do one. Right. You know, it's like um, there's a time and a place for everything. You know, and the bar is, if you're hanging out with the client afterwards at the bar, well, cool, maybe it's a little looser conversation. On the gig, you want to follow the pecking order. Ma- maintain you know who's the boss here, and, and you're there to do a job and, and do it well and come in well represented so that they look good because they hired you, and mm-hmm. then they'll want to hire you back again. Yeah, exactly. They know what they're getting, you yeah. know. If they get, you know, And there's too many guys I, I see that show up fucking hungover, <sighs> smelling of booze, unkempt, unshaved, doing these corporate events where it's like, everyone's in fucking suit and ties, man. Like, you're just... <laughs> That's why I've had to fire people. Yeah. And it's like, you know, like, you know, uh, you representing the company that hired you, you should fucking, you should do them some solids and, like, make them look good. They're paying you. And, uh, but, you know, to each their own. It's their reputation that they're they're putting out there you know totally and i know i lost uh i'm sure i lost a little bit of business that i'm unaware of because they don't nobody tells you you're totally we all do getting blacklisted and nobody tells you that they're like i don't want to use that guy again it just doesn't have you just don't get the calls right in the corporate yeah. industry everyone's very um like uh if they can they won't they just kind of like skate around any kind of confrontation and just go well he's just a contractor so we can just like never see him again yeah. right yeah and the and the opposite is like uh, that. Make sure we get that fucking guy's number is is what I try to go for. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, those the fucking you, you never know with those people, man. You never know. They're uh, they they can get offended by the easiest thing in the world. I, I've I've had it um, many. I mean, I've 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 had failures and I've had like that. Like you're saying, like that. I've had a client who I've worked with on. I'd probably done maybe six, seven shows with this client, all great, successful. I mean, and then I had one show where there was some issue that happened and it created a weird noise. And, and it was one of those just weird moments. It wasn't a feedback situation, but it was just one of those weird moments. And I got, I never got asked back. Yep. Just one, like that. And, one noise. And, and it's like, I'm sitting there going, well, all right. Well now you know what that does. I mean, I can't be pissed off with that guy because he's looking out for his business and he's got to do something. He can't bring back the same guy to the, the client who had a failure last time yeah so i mean i whatever i get it like i said it's just business it's not the personal but um what that also teaches me is well maybe i should be more diligent about something maybe i could have found something you know maybe i should spend a little more time uh with my setup and and, and double check and like i had an issue with a show where uh you know we all use playback systems i use qlab and uh i had a laptop and my channels were open and armed and I look over and I reach over to do something and, and I hit a keyboard, a, a button on the top of my keyboard, but wasn't paying attention that my forearm crossed the space bar. And as the president of this company is standing on stage, bah, 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 and I'm like, oh, fuck, grabbing the, you know, I just played a track right over him and all eyes are on me because I yep. just ruined that show. Yep. Ruined Doesn't it matter. I, I, everything about that show was perfect up to that moment. Audio mistakes are huge. So they're huge. I learned to now, and especially any, in corporate. Anytime I get near my computer, I make sure those channels are muted. Yep. And then I go over, and before I touch it again, I still make sure I double check to make sure that it was muted because I'm that OCD about it. You have to be. And then when I get ready to go again, I'm like, okay. And I'm so anal about like, okay, am I gonna fuck this up? Let me check. Hold on. Wait. No. I'm 98% sure I'm good. All right. Good. It's as close as you can get. But you know, unless that had happened to you, unless that big fucking fuck up happened, you wouldn't be so paranoid about it, and you wouldn't be so like 
it and and flawless uh, as you move forward in your fucking career as an operator. Failures create new policies. They do. I have um I've ran into um house people, right? Like I'm showing up as an independent contractor uh for the client or for the company that's written the PA and the house guys uh they uh wanted that gig for some reason, right? They're like, well, it's their fucking place, right? And so they'll sabotage the shit out of you, right? You so that you'll, all of a sudden all your speakers are unplugged and the cables are coiled back and uh, or like you know just all kinds of random shit is done uh, to fuck you, make you look bad, and make you walk in to sabotage. So now every day, every day, the first thing I do when I walk into my room is find what got sabotaged. Sometimes I don't find anything, but I dig. <laughs> Maybe a little paranoia. <laughs> yeah. I dig through everything. I check every plug, every cable, every fucking single thing. I run music through all my speakers. I make sure they're all working. Everything's right. You know what I mean? Like, well, yeah. I mean, ho- and, hopefully we all do that. Like yeah. you go through a check every day to make sure all your yeah. systems are working. Because you get, like in the beginning, I was just like, well, I mean, like at my clubs that I used to run, right? I could just walk in and go, I turn on the fucking buttons and then my system works and let's go. Boom, faders are up. No one fucked anything up and I was the last person to touch it and it works. Uh, but then I went into the corporate shit with the same attitude and that's not how it works. There are people in and out of those rooms all fucking day and night and they're curious people or they're dickheads. Uh, <laughs> either or, right? They're fucking with my stuff, uh-huh. right? And uh, and so you literally have to go fucking touch every goddamn thing and make sure like something there's something in here that's fucked and I'm gonna find it before the client gets here in the morning to say yeah. you know and uh and uh, dude i find I, and sometimes i find shit where i just you know I, you know I wasn't perfect yesterday and i maybe i should have taped that down a little better or little things like that where i even just like miss something which is great you know where i'm we're lo- walking around looking for someone trying to fuck me and i'm like oh i fucked myself <laughs> you know yeah i i keep that attitude of the um there's nothing that uh, that's below me or nothing that i'm not responsible for um yeah I, I was there was a church here in town that I was uh trying to do some volunteering with and um uh and I, I ended up finally after a few years of trying and getting in and I started seeing okay there were some glaring issues like they they do a good job of production like I said no one has more gear than God and this church has got production out the butt I mean there it's just ridiculous the high end systems that we don't even get to touch sometimes that they've got that they, they're top of the line everything and um but I see all these glaring things like RF systems that are ghosting multiple frequencies and they're not, there's like harmonics you're seeing across multiple receivers that it's like any trained professional who does half, that knows half as much as we do could sit there and go, that ain't right. Yeah. And um, so I'm, I'm looking at it going, hey, I can fix this, I can fix that. And then, and then uh, I kind of got pushed out because they were, I, I felt like they felt like I was trying to take over their gig. I'm like, dude, I don't want to take over your gig. Yeah. I want to help you. I want to teach you. I mean, the whole thing, I mean, I'm not going to get into religion, but like, if you consider yourself to be like a Christian person, you should be like nothing. I, I should be giving back and I should be yeah. teaching and giving them things. And, 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 uh, so that's what I was trying to do is like, get, I've got a wealth of knowledge and I want to give it back. But anyhow, but the thing that sparked this thought on me was you talked about taping cables down or whatever. One of the things I noticed is like, you know, they had, the lighting system that was just pulled and strung and, and, and nothing was plugged in properly. Like th- nothing was done the way it should have been done. Yeah. Like they had a, a, a truss that would run across the, the proscenium where, you know, you got the fire curtain that's supposed to come in in case there's a fire, but now there's a truss that's span bet- across this proscenium. So if this fire curtain comes down, which it's got thousands of pounds of counterweight on it. So it could, it's supposed to just come straight down like really fast and stop any fire that's on the stage, getting out to the audience. But they've now got this truss that's hung by chain motors that has lighting instruments on it that's spanning this area. So if this thing comes in, it's going to either rip down this truss and everything, and it's going to land on top of people and crush them and kill them, or it's going to keep the fire curtain from coming in, and now the fire is going to escape and kill these people who are trying to sit, run for their lives. It's like all these things, and I was like, you can't do that. They're like, oh, it's no big deal. And that's like, why we have ocean. And, and so that was one of the reasons why I was like, I was like, man, I'm trying to give back here, and you guys are just like poo-pooing it, but... Uh, 
I, one of the things I saw these cables one day. It was like they're only backstage access, going behind the curtain. Yeah. And um, everybody's crossing this path. The pastor of the churches, all the musicians are pa- crossing this path, and they've got cables that are pulled taut that are literally starting to create an angle coming up from the floor and so they're trip hazards i mean so i i see them and i start i'm I'm just walking by i'm like i can't i can't walk by this so i go and grab some white and black gaff tape and i start rerouting these cables so there's less tension on them and there's less of a reach and i start taping them in place and then i put an x white x across them and arrows and stuff like that and make it visible it's still a hazard but now it's visible and people weren't going to trip on it as likely and as i'm doing this one of the guys I'm working with goes, hey, man, that's not something you need to do. I said, somebody needs to. And it's apparently been like this for a long time. So I'm going to go ahead and do it. Yeah. And I was like, don't be lazy, man. Do the whole job. Don't don't just half-ass shit. Like, if you want to do something in life, I mean, I, I either do something 100% or don't do it at all pretty much. And I'm, and I'm pretty good at not doing anything. I'm really good at being lazy and sitting around and doing nothing. But when I involve myself and decide to get into it, it's like, Fuck, I want to do it all. I want to really be good at it. I want to I want to enjoy it. I want to get everything I can out of it. It doesn't have I'm not talking about just work. You know, it's like relationships are that way too. It's like so yeah. You know. Yeah, it's um when you talk about work ethic, man, I always um I always have a simple saying that I fucking tell people when it comes to getting a job done, and that's uh and that's fucking clean a mean toilet, man, you know? <laughs> Like, it doesn't matter what your assignment is, right? Um, when I first moved to town, I have shit, right? And I was interning, which means working for free uh, for a recording studio. And my job was to make coffee, mop the floors, clean the fucking which toilets. Which studio was it? Uh, duh, Digital Insight Recording Studios. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, it was a, a great fucking Matt best Matt was life. over there. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Matt Price. Yeah, uh, I remember Matt was, uh, Yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah fucking, uh, yeah, and... Uh, Anyways, yeah, so I would have to show up, and every day, you know, it's like I'd fucking clean those toilets, I'd, I'd mop the floors, and I'd, I'd put fucking elbow grease in. It wasn't just like, oh, you know, I'll do this so I can get into the studio sessions. It's like, no, this is your job right now, so do it very well. And, um, and I've taken that attitude into everything, you know. If you're wrapping cables, if you're taping cables, if you're... When I was running the club, it was like... um at the end of every weekend I'd be up there mopping the fucking stage it's not my fucking job you know um but the stage was dirty and it's your stage I, it's my stage yeah, yeah. I, I'm responsible for it so I'd pull the wedges up and I'd fucking I'd run a mop over it until like you know eventually the manager's like what the fuck are you doing up there bro and I was like stage is dirty you mop it when it's dirty right and I was like I'm not gonna just like walk around tell someone else in here to fucking mop the stage for me that's not my place yeah and so the, and eventually they got people to mop it for me which was great uh but like that's that's the attitude you have to take you know uh, take personal responsibility for what is given to you what you're responsible for you know that's your room that's your pa that's your stage that's your shit make it look nice you know and do 100 percent all the way uh or, or don't fucking show up to work why the fuck are you showing up yeah that and also it's like uh it does get tough sometimes and and complaining about it and saying i can't do this because or or just you know clients are going to come to us all the time especially in our our world of the corporate industry of you know they're going to want to make changes they're going to move things or, you know I, i've learned that if i if i don't have one of those shows where i'm you know pre-drawing it and figuring out my points blah blah, blah. if i walk into a room blind i go okay put my speakers in the absolute worst spot possible for me that still yeah. works but it's visibly out of everything and that's probably a good starting point. And because th- I've I've had clients come in like, oh, that doesn't work for me because I can't see this or that. Yep. And so then you have to redo it, and you're like pissed off, and you get a bad. Idea. It's like just start from the beginning of like, I don't care. Yeah. I mean, I do care. I want to deliver a great product. I yeah. want I want to do my job the best I can. I if I don't if I'm not having a good day, then I'm 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 angry. So, but I understand that's the way that's the world we live mm-hmm. in. And and um, I've done. There's a few stories where I can like these. There was a crew of guys who actually worked with me. I helped produce some events for a client where we were doing the concerts uh, that were leading up to their event or whatever, and um, they'd bring in, like, big-name acts or whatever the deal was. And so we would provide all the production, and we'd go into this nightclub, and 
We would set up front of house and monitors. We built a stage over a bar kind of deal. I mean, it was all difficult, like f- fitting it into a space that wasn't made for this kind of thing. And it's what we do all the time, anyhow. I mean, it's like it's part of what we do. And so I had there was a rack of some. Uh, this guy wanted racks of gear at front of house, and he, and it was all heavy. And then we only had a, a narrow way to get up. But if t- two guys, and it was heavy, so if two guys stood on the top end, shoulder to shoulder, each holding a handrail and each holding a, a handle of the case, and two guys repeated that on the bottom, they could hustle up the like you know five six stairs to the first landing and five six stairs to the second landing, and then they'd be done. But these guys like all come to me and they're like complaining like oh man this is gonna be hard this is bullshit can't we just hook up a chain over there and i'm like no man it's just it's it's gonna be a quick easy move doing that is a pain in my ass it involves me getting a a chain motor in here and a guy's gonna cost me a thousand bucks to do this thing it's like just fucking it's an easy it's what i hired you for i I mean come on i would never ask you to do it if i wasn't willing to do it myself and finally i got pissed off and i was like you know what fuck y'all I'll just take care of the damn thing myself. And I walked over and I pulled the thing over to the steps. And I got turned just the way I said. And I grabbed it by the two handles. And I one stepped at a time without like banging the rack as I went up. And I got it up those first five, six steps by myself. I said, here, I got it half the way. Can you all finish it for me? Yeah. And they all like held their head down in shame. And they're like, well, shit, I guess we have to do it now. You do have like, to fuck, do it And now. fuck you for not doing it the first time. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, man. It's just a gig. Just get the gig. You know how much time we spent arguing over this? Yeah. Could have been That's done. That's time already. we could have been sp- sitting at the bar drinking a beer after, after the gig. Yeah, we can talk about it later. Yeah. Don't during the gig, just get the gig done. Let's go. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Fucking, you know, coming up with fucking uh, excuses and not answers is just fucking whining. Yeah, man. You know, like uh, you, you, you got to come to come to me with solutions, man. I have a I have a steadfast rule in my life, and I, I adapted this. I don't know how many years back, but. I used to get worked up about shit. I used to have anxiety issues over things and whatever. And I would worry about the, the things that I, that, like I, like a lot of people do. You think about your thoughts. Oh, this is going to happen, whatever, anxiety, whatever. And I learned through like my practice of yoga and meditation, but it was like, uh, if I can't control something, if, or first off, if something bothers me enough, I either have two choices. I have to do something about it and fix the problem, or I have to get over it and move on. But either way, there's like there has to be an end to this. I can't just dwell on it forever. And if it bothers me enough that I'm dwelling on it longer than I want to, then I absolutely have to do something about it. But if, you know, it's like that that whole I call it wasting time. Yeah. You're you're waste you 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 only have so many guaranteed minutes out of life, and they're not guaranteed. <laughs> and, you know, if I'm gonna sit there and be driving down the road stressing, like, I, my father used to always, and he still to this day does this gets worked up over how people drive yeah and it comes from his own ptsd from being in the military and being involved in a really bad accident over there and all that sort of stuff and i get it whatever but i learned from that to be the opposite of like when somebody i I drive fast but when somebody's flying past me whatever as long as they didn't like cut me off i really don't give a shit you know i'm like whatever go cool if you're gonna ride my ass i still don't give a shit (laughs) i mean i drive a truck so yeah yeah i'm good but um even if they're gonna cut you off, like I'll I'll give them space. Come on in, bud. Yeah. Get the fuck get get the fuck in front of me. Haul yeah. ass. Get out of my universe, my <laughs> space, my my exactly. existence. Right. I'd like, rather you be down there causing you some go shit. Fucking <laughs> get, yeah. Go get it, man. Like I'm not gonna get in your way. I'm not gonna like personalize that you're in a hurry. Into like, oh, that guy cut me off. You know, like he doesn't fucking know me. Doesn't care about me. You know, like. He's just tr- trying to get somewhere, you know, yeah. and it's not, it's not responsible of me to personalize that shit and then all of a sudden be consumed by it because now all of a sudden, now you're in the past and you're stuck in that moment in the past and you're just like fucking, you're just trapped in your own fucking head raging at all this insane shit that you could have done in the past that's you can't do now, right? But like, you'll you know, fucking think about that. The all only, the way home. You know, the only thing about good about looking into your past and thinking about the, your history is to think how I would have maybe done it differently. Yeah. And then, and then that's a terrible or, or, or to enjoy the moment. Yeah. Because of whatever reason, but yeah. Yeah. The 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 I could have done it differently thing. That scenario. The second I catch myself doing that, I'm like, what the 
fuck are you doing, bro? You're just going to live in fantasy land? <laughs> huh? It's like, focus on the moment, sir. <laughs> You're here right now. Sing mm-hmm. the fucking song that's on the radio and get out of your own fucking head, man. Oh, no doubt, man. And, uh... And, but it's like, yeah, you'll get lost in it, you know? You'll get lost in it. And the, the fucking, that's that's a that's a great one, the what I could have done differently. I, you know, I had I had a moment like that you yesterday. torture yourself forever. I had a moment like that yesterday. So I've, I've uh, been uh, going through this divorce for over a year now. And it's like, so you st- start dating and uh, it has its funds and, you know. So I, I start dating this girl and I'm, and, uh, it, it starts fizzling out and you start getting in your head. You're like, well, you start thinking about it. like, well, what, what, what happened? You know, I mean, I'm not quite sure. I mean, everything seemed good. All the signs are pointing towards this and da, da, da. And you're, you're like, I wanted to date just her. And, and so you go through that. And, 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 and so I was getting into my head a little bit. I was like, you know, like bummed. And, and I was like, and I sat there and I go, why am I wasting my time? I mean, ho- I mean, literally wasting your time. Maybe, maybe there's still a chance of something happening, but nonetheless, why am I wasting my time right now being bummed out about this? I need to get out of my head. I need to stop this. I need to figure it out. So I went out and I took a walk and I drove and I went over to my ex-wife's house and picked up some legal documents. And I had some thoughts about the other things we were talking about. What's next? I mean, like I got really excited about the idea of me going down this venture of, going back to after like owning some gear maybe and having a production company side of things and um seeing where that path takes me and and, and i've already writ- written a business plan for my plans for the previous one so all i have to do is take that business plan and adapt it to my new plan um so i mean i'm i physically halfway there with that part of it and so i got excited about it and i got and i, and I found motivation in my thoughts and i was like i can make this real i believe in this it's not something that i'm just fairy tailing where you're sitting there going oh i'm going to do this thing it's like we have i know tons of friends who are always going to be like oh dude i got this idea i'm like yeah whatever you always have an idea but you don't actually follow through with your shit i have friends like that and too. um and so i'm big one of those things like i said i can i can be a hundred percent involved or i can be a hundred percent out and lazier and shit if i have to and that's my choices. There's not a whole lot in between. I don't, if I'm not passionate about something, I don't want to do it. I don't do it. And and I enjoy simplicities in life. I en- also enjoy the hustle of life. And uh, I mean, I'm living in a 450 square foot guest house right now, and I'm digging it. I mean, I got like a queen bed with a couch next to it, and a j- little drum kit with a little computer and recording setup. And I'm um, hopefully this summer creating videos with my son, and, uh, doing our thing. And so it's like. I like the simplicity of that and I like the I like the ability for me to just sit there and kind of be in my own oneness there. But I also love the hustle and I love being around lots of people and I kind of need that balance in life and um yeah, life's all but, about balance. But either way, it's like I give 100% to things and it's like or I just or I go, I'm out because I don't like wasting my time. Yeah. Doing things that I don't love. I mean, I, when I, you're talking about the working for a recording studio. When I first graduated from college, uh, my my path was my my chosen path was to become a recording engineer and producer and make a bunch of big hit records and be that guy and because I you know I thought I had some skill that somebody else didn't or whatever so and I uh, I had so when I got out of college I went and interned at a couple of studios and I would work my ass off and interns as you say is being unpaid and you're going there and you're doing and, and sometimes you, I got paid for some things do like edit dumps at the middle of the night or something like that where you're transferring from analog to digital and that was still when analog really drove the world of two inch tape and but it was starting to grow with the Sadie systems and infancy of Pro Tools or whatever and um, but I delivered pizzas at Domino's Pizza so that I'd have a little bit of money and I could go home with pizza and I was working like 100 hour weeks uh, I would I would average and uh, coming home with like 10 12 grand a year I was broke yeah. And I was like, fuck, man, I can't do this forever, man. This, So I got hooked up with a job. It was a government job doing some stuff, and, and it was making a lot more money. And I hated it. I quit it, like, within two weeks. And I said, I don't care. Like, the money that I make is not what's important. It's a thing that I do. Absolutely. And so that's the secret in life right like there. It, and so I learned this. Like, if you if you have a passion for what you do and you're really good at it, that's the key. You have to, it has to be a checks and balances to life. Like as I've raised my rate or as I've gone gr- grown in my career, my clients are expecting something from me that for for the, what they pay. If I'm not delivering those things, I can't just sit there and say I want more money. Yeah. Give me more money. They'll be like, "Well, why? What makes you worth more than you were last week?" Not to mention there's fucking 
two dozen guys that are hustling to be exactly. better than you. Exactly. They're reading every fucking manual exactly. and they're fucking they're on top of everything okay. and they're training in vector works all fucking week and going to classes. That's and it's like and they're gonna ask for the same amount of money you're gonna ask for. Yeah. Well that's part of the reason why I need to do certain things to make myself better and that's why I constantly work on getting training and I and I've also not necessarily taken the same path that everybody else has and what how I do my work. I am still very focused on my creative uh, you know, aspects and I what, what I do is and I've had a few shows where I've done some really cool shit with surround sound or whatever and um, and, and it's a lot of fun you know and, and, and especially to introduce those elements to what is like I said before like we've been forced to have these small distributed audio systems that don't block the visual so having any sort of like audience focus with your audio being able to say the sound comes from here or it moves around or, or does anything interesting and creative other than just be there mm-hmm. uh, i mean like the, the biggest audience the biggest audio wow factor you can get is loud when it <laughs> comes to most of these things like a lot of subs it's like yeah. oh wow that was cool but it's not and and so so i've been working on trying to introduce elements that like uh using like uh like l acoustics has the elisa processor Meyer has uh, their processing. You know, they all they all have different processing, and you're, you use this software to manipulate the sound. And you know, with it comes a new sound design, a, a way of putting up speakers that's different than what you've done before. So now, and and and, and also it's 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 multi-channel based. So I have to take an individual source of something and be able to place it somewhere. When I uh, do a normal distributed audio system that's a corporate event kind of deal it's a big mono blast it's you take one microphone you put it out of every speaker and that's how it works well I can't do that now I mean I can still do that with the presenter on stage and I can have that idea and focus that way but um, I now need to make to make the cool elements I need to have it multi-channel I need to have to take one thing and move it from there to there and uh, I can change like depth and whatever. There's a lot of different variables, but I can do all this work. But I have to convince somebody to wire it that way. No, no, no. Well, I I come up with a design, yeah. you know, and, and I I work with the the manufacturers or whatever on specs and um, and I I, I create the content and I you know I work with either it's like I, I did that that Dreamforce gig where I went out and recorded. I had eight uh eight boundary microphones spread around like through the high desert and recorded a 24 hour scene that I edited down to a 12 hour scene of nature. And then I, uh, was fortunate to work with Dan Dugan who does these, all these nature recordings out in Yosemite and places. And he gave me some four channel surrounds of his recordings. And I used that as like a foundation. And then I went to sound, uh, sound design libraries where people like who create movie sound designs and stuff like that. They upload their license, you know, material and I buy the license for the material and I place them in places and, but they're all individual elements. And I had like that that design right there was uh, what you would call technically a thirty-seven point one surround sound that covered <laughs> that covered the size of a football field. Yeah. And so I had you know twelve big line arrays down this big three hundred thirty foot psych and uh, and then twenty five overhead zones with a centralized sub frequency and and then I beyond that a ton of floor speakers that were creating like creaks, bubbling creaks and whatever. So that's all. F- that's, that's awesome. I love doing that shit. Um, but I have to convince the client that they have to do that. And and audio, like I said, it's it's they don't want to see it, but it better be good and cover the whole room and never feed back, and uh, and be cheap. Yeah. So with all these all these variables that I have to throw into the mix, I mean, I have to first off hang the speakers in a totally different way. I have to use probably thirty to forty percent more speakers to cover the way the room that I the way that I need to, um, which takes more time and more motors and more whatever, more and more. So they're spending like we'll call it forty percent more on the audio rental alone, and then they're gonna have to pay me more money to design it up front. They have to pay me more money to create the content, and so on and so forth. So I, what I see is like a bunch of no, no, no stop signs that are right in front of me, like based on all these things. And like logical mind would be like, there's no fucking way that you can ever convince somebody to do that shit. Um, so what it comes down to is like I have to get to the person or the the person who can say yes on the front end of things with the creative side. And I have to be able to tie in all of the things they want to accomplish in their show, but I have to I have to sell it to them in a way that they get my passion for it and they understand why it makes sense to do it this way. And you know, everybody's always you know, it's it's been an innovation for uh, you know, video and, and the visual elements have been innovating like 
the, the set pieces forever for the last like 15 years at least. And everything has kind of a shelf life before you're like, okay, what's next? And, you know, my sales pitch to these guys was, you know, first off, that was one of the biggest comments people got from me. I, I got from people was, how did you convince them to spend that much money on this, on this audio system when it's just really a background audio system? I said, because I explained to them you know, how cool it was and how it was going to make it a totally different real. I mean, like they were going to walk through and realize I'm somewhere. I'm not in the Moscone, you know, uh, convention center. I'm, I'm out in nature and it's going to feel, you're going to feel it. And so I had to sell them and I kind of the sales pitch is, you know, you, you have, you walk into most of these events and people are, you know, you 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 spend all this time putting up banners and coming up with logos and video roles and whatever else that happens that's pre-show and it's supposed to be the draw and the attention and, you know, the, the product, the brand, the whatever. But people are walking in and they've got their cell phones and they're on, they're on conversations or reach emails or getting cups of coffee or they're talking to somebody else or whatever. And majority of the people in the room aren't absorbing any of that shit that you spent a lot of time, meetings and all that sort of stuff, focusing on those things. Because they're the things you've done for years and years and years. You're like, oh, well, this has worked before. We're going to create banners. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to do that. So nobody, nobody is involved because nothing's different. Nothing's new going on in the room. They're just like, okay, we walked into the space. Where's the coffee? Yeah. And, um, but then when, then when you add in the elements of, of immersive, an immersive experience, so you can, they have, you know, video panning heads that are mo- like moving lights, or they have, or you can place video elements throughout the room that help you follow the visual. But the one thing that you're always going to be, you're, it's going to trigger your senses. The first thing is audio because you, you don't need to see it to hear it. And so if I have a, a sound system that's covering the room and I've got a message that somebody wants to say, that's like a, we're driving home, like this year's event is about this, you can have a, a message that goes around the room in a 360 kind of like moving, panning kind of way, but then people go, whoa, what was that? And, they, and they, their senses kick in, but you, now you have a visual that follows that thing. And so now you grab them. Yeah. And so these people who had their cell phones or, or having these conversations are going, dude, did you see that? And they're putting their phones away and they're engaging and they're becoming involved with what you, so you, you've grabbed their attention from the beginning. And now you, throughout the show, you add, use these spectacular elements to make all your introductions that much cooler. You make all your entertainment that much cooler and people walk away from that event going, that was awesome. I can't wait for next year. And, you know, so that's like what I see as being the thing that I can hopefully still charge forward with and do that. Um, and have that as like, that's the thing I want to do. You know, this, what you're doing here, the podcast, like what I was getting at before is like having that second thing that you can do or that other thing that you can do. It, it keeps our br- creative people need to mix it up. I know oh, yeah. a lot of friends who are like hardcore artists and they're changing mediums all the time and um, they push themselves in different directions. That's the way they get better. And some musician friends are the same way. It's I'm the same way. It's like I I love doing sound, but I can't just sit there and set up a sound system and have somebody you know, do microphones and whatever. It's like, yeah, that's cool, but what else? And we were talking about yeah. like doing installs, or, you know, or whatever. It's like there's so many facets. Yeah. And if I if I do just one, I'm going to become a grumpy old sound guy. Oh yeah, and I mean I've kind of gotten to that point. I mean I've been doing sound for 20 years. Like it's, uh, it's kind of ran its course for me to. I love it, right? Like, don't get me wrong, but it's like, um, it's not something that's too much of a challenge anymore for me. Like, this is a challenge for me, right? Like, yeah. I'm not a video guy. Uh, so, like, doing all this video stuff, doing the video switching, learning how to set up all these graphics cards and ev- do video editing. Yeah, but you got the, buddies like Jeremy Morrow. Who I, got, I got buddies like Jeremy Morrow <laughs> or like Clint Long, who's going to be on the podcast later, who, you know, I got great friends, like we were talking about, that you can call and they just give you, you know, it's it's really nice to have those people there that uh, they know they've done it before and so they're helping me get uh, get shit moving. Yeah. And uh, they've even loaned me gear that they're not using and shit like that. It's it's really cool to have um, a network of friends that is there for you when you're moving in different directions, like you said, changing mediums. Um, and yeah, I just love it. I love it so much. I really hope that it turns into a real um, monetary situation for me to where I can, uh, you know, Angela and I can both like, you know, do this yeah. for a living like an actual living uh that would be really fucking cool man because we really now, enjoy now be it. a good time for thumbs up 
Thumbs up yeah. indeed. Yes, yeah, please. Thumbs up, like, share, like, share, all that stuff. Okay. Like, and, uh, yeah, we're coming up on the two-hour mark anyways. We might as well just fucking roll a hootie, fucking wrap this bad bitch up. And, uh, and yeah, get on with our fucking lives, man. I think it's a great point. I'm running out of hard drive space anyways. Thank you so. very much for having me, man. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, we got more to talk about, I see. So we'll, uh, we're, we're going to have another one. Stuff. Yeah, we'll figure it out. We'll have another one for sure. Um, Things will have to be done that we talked about today. Yeah. In the process of. I'm really interested in um, the specifics of your media creation. You're talking about going out into the desert and creating these nature sounds that you're going to distribute to multiple speaker systems through different matrices. Because uh, that's fucking fascinating. Yeah, I totally, we should talk some sound design next time. Yeah, I totally get like the um, everything you're doing on the live front on the back when when it's your finished product. But I totally want to discuss like how you're going about the media cr- creation of like the desert scape. You're talking about like putting out what did you say, thirty-seven microphones? No, or? that was eight. So I, I uh, that was another one. You know, hitting up friends, getting good yeah. deals, and whatever. But I had eight of the same Omni microphones, and I put them on little stands, and I, I had like a space that was probably so there was five across the front. So you imagine a left, left center, center, right center, right, and then a right surround, right surround, left surround, and center surround, and. It, it kind of imagines it's like an egg shape or whatever in space, but it covers from front to back 100 feet and in width probably about another like 80 feet or whatever it was. But it, it was so it was a massive area that I could hear different things walking through and you just set them all at the same gain level and put them in places where like, you know, I wanted to put them near a, a tree. So if wind blew, you heard the rustling of a tree and trees are probably going to draw in the bees or the birds. So you want to hear those sounds, too. And so, you know, placement was important and uh, just making sure that I had gain structure. And then a lot of ba- because we're out in the middle of the desert where there's no power. So we had to have a lot of batteries for the recorder. Right. And I would literally set an alarm like every two and a half, three hours, go over and change a battery. Oh, okay. And me and my buddy Larry, we sat out there and brought some brought some food, some booze and some weed and, and sat out there and just press record. I got the input on how to do it from Dan Dugan. OK. And uh, I met him at an NAB gig a few years back. And I, I told him, I was like. Like, yeah, yeah, you're, you're really cool because you created this auto mixer that everybody in live audio, especially in the yeah. corporate and television world, everybody uses. This it's thing. our favorite it's like, toy. Yeah, exactly. It saves so many shows. Uh, so that's cool and all. And, and, but I want to ask you about this recording that you do when you go out in the desert. I said, that fascinates me because like going out there and just being quiet and listening to sound and then listening to it back and then using it. And that was kind of before I had this idea of doing this with Elisa and, um, uh, and before I had a client to sell it to, but I was like, I was like, man, I'm, I really would like to do that. So he gives me like a little thumb drive of one of his recordings, like a you know le- a stereo recording mix down. And so then I uh, started thumbling through, and then I went to Infocom, and I knew some people through that worked at L Acoustics at, uh, through Contacts Career or whatever, and they were doing a demo of Lisa, and I walked in and I saw this demo, and I was like, man, this is some cool shit. I mean, I could really do something, but how do I, all those things I mentioned before, how do I do it? How do I convince somebody to do something totally different than what they've done before and spend more money doing it at the same time? And uh, and then I started thinking about what I'd done with, and I talked about with Dan, and um, so yeah, so then I had a client come across who I'd done this, this show for them, Dreamforce, year after year, and they were firing the production company, and I was the only person that they were going to keep over from the creative team because they liked the work I'd done years past. But I'd done years past just using automation through playback systems and stuff like that, just moving things, from, you know, creating a bunch of stereo zones and stuff like that or whatever, and moving things across space that way. But it was kind of, it was good enough. It was like what you would hear if you went to a, a theme park or something like that. It wasn't like creating an overall environment. It was just, it worked. Yeah. And, 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 and for, to be honest with you, man, this is all background shit that, they, people, they don't want to distract away from what they're there for, looking at the product and, and learning things and whatever else. Like, they want it to be literally the background. And they want it to be like nature. And so uh, then I found out about this Lisa thing, and I was like, oh, shit. And then I started, and I got brought into with Dreamforce, and uh, the company's called actually Salesforce, but the show's called Dreamforce. But uh, I talked to the production company, who, the main producer of the show, and uh, I said, I got this great idea. And I'd never seen the box before in my entire life. And I mean, I, I, I saw the box, but I mean, I didn't, I knew nothing about it. I knew nothing about how to operate it or tune it. I never, there was no training at this point and it was pretty new on in the industry. A couple concerts had done it and no one in the corporate industry had even considered doing it. And it was n- totally new. And I was like, I got this idea. And they were like, all right. And I had the production company that was doing it. 
providing the gear and such. The guy who owned it believed in the the sales pitch I gave him, and he's like, I, he made next to no money on it, and he was willing to do it, and he bought new gear to support to, to support it, and he was like, I think it's cool, let's do it. And I was like, well, fuck, all right. That's so great. <laughs> so then I, I got to do it a couple more times after that, and it was a lot of fun. But it's ex- it. you know whatever. It's expensive. Yeah. It's always fucking money. Well, cool, man. Yeah, that's uh. That's fucking fascinating, dude. I really appreciate you having me or have me having you on my show. Yeah, man. Uh, and uh, yeah, you know, I got. I look forward to having you back again. Of course, man. We'll fucking talk more sound design. And I'm actually proud of both of us. You know, we didn't start getting into frequencies or fucking <laughs> microphones or you. We didn't speak audio to each other. I think like one time, like that one joke I caught sending your way talking about attack. Yeah. We were pretty good about it. We talked a bit audio, but, you know, yeah. but the, you know what I mean? The language, the, I, I think the, the lingo big... where you start just saying numbers back and forth to each other. And oh, we yeah. totally know what the fuck we're talking about, yeah. but we're literally we like the majority of the words coming out of our mouth are different numbers and people are like what the fuck did you just say to that person i get so like, used to talking to people who don't get what we do for a living yeah. that i and then when i start talking to people i go like oh never mind you know all what i'm talking never mind so jumping ahead i can yeah. like skip all this introductory shit <laughs> yeah i'm like uh i think we were good we were good boys about that this time all right fucking uh but now yeah, man uh you're the fucking man and uh thank you josh appreciate, appreciate you, you. Thank josh you. conway everybody peace, yeah. peace. Hey everyone, thanks for watching my podcast. You can check out more podcasts right here and subscribe by clicking right here. We are a new podcast every Monday morning at 6 a.m. Pacific Standard Time.